Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Central European University. My name is Robert Pepper. I'm a professor of practice in the School of Public Policy, and I'm also the director of the Center for Conflict, Negotiation, and Recovery, which is a very new uh, center that we're opening in the School of Public Policy to address, as the name suggests, issues of conflict and recovery. Um, and rather like the um, the Budapest Center for the International Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities, we're a forward-looking center aimed at uh, coming up with practical solutions to <coughs> problems that exist right now. The Central European University obviously has uh, a large number of uh, components that address issues of uh, genocide and mass atrocities from the memorialization of the Holocaust. The university is one of the centers of uh, the collection of the Scheller Foundation through to the Human Rights Program and other uh, areas in both law and international relations and other departments that address many of the sort of current and past uh, problems that we face. Now this part of the world has obviously seen some of the, the worst crimes carried out in the 20th century. So it's particularly apt that uh, these four countries should be gathering together to look at the issue of the responsibility to protect. I think the four countries in the Visegrad group carry a sort of moral weight and responsibility to address these issues and to carry this issue forward, particularly uh, the issue of responsibility to protect. And the idea that states actually have a responsibility <coughs> to uh, avoid the sorts of uh, atrocities that uh, this region has unfortunately seen so many times. R2B has been somewhat buffeted as an idea in recent uh, years. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism, particularly following the uh, invocation of R2P principle uh, as part of the removal of uh, Gaddafi in Libya. Nevertheless, I think like uh, many of these things, it's going to be a long work in progress, and there are many ways in which um, they can be improved, worked on, and become not just a, a, a norm at a diplomatic level, but a concept that's very broadly accepted around the world. I don't think it's going away. It's certainly going to face criticism and obstructions and difficulties, but it's not something that is going to uh, be beaten back. Um, I think uh, in the future, we will look back at this time and, and see that this was the start of a, a very important concept in international law, and international laws. I'm going to keep my remarks very short today because I really want to allow the other speakers to uh, have a chance. And I'm going to turn uh, the microphone over to um, Mr. Ferenc Yali from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, sorry, I got that right. Sorry, I'm confused because the names, unfortunately, two of the speakers have changed on the. Um, um, <coughs> And so we have uh, another speech, sorry, from the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, it's the uh, deputy of the B4 and Central European uh, Initiative National Coordinator. Thank you very much. My name is Zoltan Korbat. I'm the deputy national B coordinator for the Visegrad Corporation in our, in our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And, um, Yes. Okay. Mr. Di Mr. Director, Excellencies, colleagues, and ladies and gentlemen, let me say at the outset how happy I am to attend this roundtable on prevention of mass atrocities in practice. On behalf of Mrs. Edith Silanian Atorfi, head of the Secretariat for the Year of Central Europe of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I wish to thank the organizers for the invitation. Unfortunately, due to other commitments, uh, Mrs. Bakker here was unable to attend this remarkable event. And in the beginning, let me introduce briefly the Visegrad Corporation. For the past two decades, the Visegrad Group has been providing a precious framework for cooperation between the Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary, and Slovakia for the stability and prosperity of our region, building on their common history and heritage. The Visegrad Four, as we call these countries, 
have learned that by working together they can represent their particular values and interests in Europe and the world more successfully. By joining their efforts, they can realize more effectively the economic potential inherent in the central European region and improve the life of their citizens. Uh, there is no doubt about it, the Visegrad group has earned a remarkable recognition and became something like an international brand. The Hungarian presidency of the Visegrad group, uh, incumbent presidency, has taken the lead in issues that are important for the report and to apply the practical and flexible methods typical for the report in order to promote the growth of our region and to develop the relation between the citizens. We firmly believe the cooperation among these four countries should be further extended. The Hungarian before presidency has without its priorities and in this environment. Uh, when we are talking about the role of the Richard cooperation in preventing of genocide and mass atrocities, uh, I would like to emphasize that we continue to see this group grouping or this cooperation as an excellent framework for implementing two key foreign policy priorities of common interest. Advocating EU enlargement policy that applies to the Western Balkan region and supporting EU neighborhood policy towards the Eastern Partnership countries. We believe the Euro-Atlantic integration of the, of, the, of the Western Balkan countries must be based on reconciliation among the nations in the region. But this process cannot be credible without the uncovering and proper definition of the war crimes committed during the last armed conflicts in the region. Since 2012, the Visharat Corporation has been a contributor both to the EU neighborhood and enlargement policy through the International Visegrad Fund. My colleague, Mr. Yanui, will probably further elaborate on that. The Visegrad Fund uh, provides project-based financial assistance to these countries. Uh, at the very end, let me have a personal remark. Uh, <coughs> having served in Sarajevo at the Hungarian Embassy for a couple of years, uh, I have visited the monument, of the memorial of the Srebrenica massacre in Botocari, in Srebrenica. So, in some way, how should I put it, I am personally very much interested in the outcome of uh, this uh, roundtable and also the outcome of the project. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you. Well, we're now going to um, uh, turn to uh, Valencia Ali, the Deputy Director of the International Physical Aid Fund. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Valencia Ali, really, Valencia Ali is my name. And uh, our chairman, our chairman referred me to the uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs, which is not entirely wrong, by the way. Uh, since uh, I'm still supposed to be on the payroll of the ministry, at least I haven't got anything on the portfolio yet. Uh, but at the moment, I am not representing the ministry, I'm representing a different organization which is called the International Visual Fund. And on behalf of the International Visual Fund, I very warmly welcome you on this beautiful day, and the sun is shining on the round table today, which is a good sign. Uh, <coughs> Uh, let me just say a few words about the International Visegrad Fund. Uh, probably not everybody in the room is entirely familiar uh, with this organization, which is actually the only formal institution of the V4 cooperation. It goes back at a 13-year-old history. Uh, it was brought to existence in uh, the year 2000 by the four Visegrad Prime Ministers of that time. Interesting to, to name those four. Uh, Zema representing the Czech Republic, Zurinda from uh, the Slovak Republic, uh, Jerzy Buzek representing Poland, and Viktor Orban, the Hungarian Prime Minister. Uh, <coughs> all four seem to be and are, definitely are, I mean, so you know, no one can deny that there is a very uh, committed supporters of the Russian cooperation, and the reason why uh, the, the fund was uh, instituted uh, was manifold. I mean, uh, basically, the, the, uh, one of the reasons was to strengthen the Shepard cooperation, the cooperation of the four Shepard countries in a variety of areas. But even more importantly, uh, the, the, the 
probably the main goal was to involve the public in the official cooperative, to, to give a grassroots support uh, to this cooperation framework, which was instituted in uh, 1991, uh, and to involve uh, the public through uh, the civil society organizations. And in the course of time, uh, the fund has assumed other responsibilities, basically one very important responsibility, and this is to assist in the implementation of every foreign policy positions of the V4 countries. And that we, when we speak about every foreign policy uh, positions, then the main area is our immediate neighborhood, the Western Balkans and the Eastern Balkans countries. So with this uh, background in mind, uh, we at the International Michelle Fund, to which I am just contracted for a set period, so I'm not a regular employee for that. Uh, so we are particularly pleased uh, to assist or and support events uh, which uh, uh, are uh, potentially bringing an added value to our cooperation, to, to the legal cooperation, and which uh, help uh, experts from the four Michigan countries uh, to conceptualize, build, enhance, and refine their understanding and their capabilities uh, in important areas, uh, which we uh, and uh, concerning certain problems which uh, we all have to face here in this part of the world and internationally. Some in our countries may think that uh, uh, the threat of genocide and uh, mass atrocity firmly behind us. But uh, especially in this part of the world, this point told us otherwise. Uh, so we are all aware of the heinous crimes which have been committed in the wider region uh, of uh, Central Eastern Europe and the Western Balkans uh, in the not too distant past. Uh, and uh, more than that, so we are still witnesses uh, almost on an everyday basis hate speech and incitement. Uh, there are people who have been suffering because of that among us. There are people who lost their uh, loved ones in the recent past. Uh, so therefore, I mean, this is an issue I've been mean, fighting hate speech, fighting incitement, fighting mass atrocities and genocide uh, is uh, an important aspect of uh, any democratic uh, 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 of, of, the, of any democratically uh, elected government in, in, in this part of the world. So the responsibility to protect is a responsibility by both the authorities and by the, by the public, by the civil society. So that, that, that is why we welcome all the behind such initiatives that, that uh, have been brought forward by the Budapest Center to mobilize public opinion and to build capacities build capacities in our Michigan region uh, in order to uh, produce experts uh, who are capable of uh, conceptualizing and understanding the problem and also acting, contributing to international efforts uh, to fight uh, 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 genocide, mass atrocities, hate speech, incitement, uh, 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 directly against minority groups. <clears throat> the, that is why uh, the director of the fund who was supposed to be here, but unfortunately, he, which he, she is a lady, a young lady, and a beautiful lady, a young lady, by the way, so this is your bad luck that I have to, have to come here instead of her. Uh, uh, she, I mean, she had to travel to Helsinki, that's why she came up here, but she decided uh, to uh, uh, give us symbolic support at the outset uh, to the Budapest Center in order to. Uh, uh, to help the center in its activities, uh, but we uh, are very much uh, voting uh, to, uh, and very much considering uh, to give further support uh, to projects that would assist uh, the process of building other uh, capabilities uh, in the four Michigan countries uh, to be active and useful contributors uh, to the local, regional, and international efforts in the area of prevention of genocide. Uh, and mass atrocities. So with this intention in mind, I wish good deliberations in today's round table, and I wish I have success to the activity of the Budapest Center. Thank you very much. Okay.
thank you. And um, our final speaker on this uh, welcome session is uh, the head of the uh, Budapest Center for International Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities, uh, Wilson Tucker. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, we succeeded to convene such a nice uh, audience, such a nice participants circle uh, for the for the round table. And uh, Sunshine really has uh, surprised us, and we do hope that all the, the spirit of our meeting today will be also in the spirit of, uh, in, in the, in the, in the, of Sunshine. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I wanted to report my thanks uh, to uh, Bob Amber, uh, the recently appointed director of the Center um, for Crisis Negotiations and uh, Recovery in the School of Public uh, Policies. And, um, and you know, it has, been, has become a tradition for us that um, they organize the roundtables uh, in the Central European University, which is a founder of the, of the foundation and uh, the Budapest Center for the National Prevention of Genocide and Mass and so this is the usual room, the proper room where we used to uh, uh, convene our meetings. Uh, I do hope that this uh, relationship and this collaboration will uh, enhance further uh, in the future with the Central European University. Uh, my gratitude also goes to the Vishagrad Fund for the, for the financial support, for the political support that we have uh, received uh, for this event that I very pleased to hear that we may have some further perspectives uh, for the cooperation, uh, which would be very important, and I do hope that it will not be just for one year, but uh, for the next uh, years, uh, uh, we shall establish a very strong and close uh, uh, relationship. Um, let me also express my particular thanks uh, uh, for the UN office uh, of the special advisor. Uh, on prevention of genocide and uh, the responsibility to protect, protect uh, which is represented here by Mrs. Uh, Jennifer Welsh, the UN Secretary General Special Advisor for the Responsibility to Protect, uh, who will be the keynote speaker uh, of, our, of our event. And uh, allow me just two short remarks in that uh, regard. Uh, firstly, that uh, she has been appointed as a, just recently, as last July, as a Special Advisor. So on behalf of the whole audience, uh, that we wish you much success in this difficult uh, domain. And uh, the other point is that uh, we do have uh, a memorandum of understanding with the UN, US, UN uh, Office uh, for, the special, for the Special Advisor for uh, Genocide Prevention for two years, and uh, the collaboration uh, develops very successfully uh, within this framework. Um, I want just to remind you that uh, this uh, two-day roundtable is uh, very close to the date of the 65th anniversary of the uh, 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 Convention uh, on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, which has been on 9th December 1948. So uh, it's good for us to remember that, to bear in mind, and uh, to uh, enhance our efforts. Part of uh, develop uh, uh, our cooperation in this field. Uh, just one year ago, we have had our recent uh, meeting here. Our, our meeting uh, here on the roundtable, that time we spoke about, uh, discussed this subject of hate speech. Um, and for this last year, uh, we have uh, made far progress uh, in the Budapest Center. Um, we tried to uh, enhance our, our efforts uh, to map the uh, capabilities of the European Union, um, the convened as a task force, um, uh, and uh, the results of that uh, of that work uh, will be presented uh, by the by Mr. Christoph Meyer, professor, the co-chair of the of this of this task force. The aim uh, of our of our um, uh, report uh, and of our intention our intention is that uh, we want to generate discussion on the capabilities of the EU institutions and member states to build up the adequate institutional and national capabilities um, and strategies in this domain, the domain of mass atrocities prevention. And uh, we, we hope that our current event will also give a further push uh, to this uh, ambition. 
we have successfully also developed our cooperation. I just want to apologize for being slightly tardy in arriving. My only excuse is that we chose to walk because it was so beautiful um, across the, the bridges of Budapest. It was a gorgeous morning, so thank you for that. But I apologize if we were slightly late in arriving. Um, I also want to thank the Budapest Center. Um, as was mentioned, there's an important uh, memorandum of understanding between our joint office in New York and the Budapest Center. Um, and we see the center is playing a really crucial role for us in developing our thinking on mass atrocity prevention. But I think it's also just important to note that uh, while there are a number of centers dedicated to this theme in the United <coughs> States, with whom we work very closely, there's of course a precious few in other parts of the world. Um, and the Budapest Center is a really important uh, foundational pillar of this work in Europe. Uh, and that makes it particularly important for us. So I want to thank them and, and thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for hosting me but also thank the, the Central European University. Uh, as I mentioned to, to some of you last night, as a newly uh, minted PhD just over 20 years ago, uh, I was involved in the very early years of the CEU when I was still located in Prague. Uh, and I spent probably what was one of the most exciting summers of my life, the summer of 1992, uh, at the Central European University in Prague teaching international relations to students from all over uh, the former Soviet Union uh, and Eastern Europe. And so it's, uh, it's truly a delight to be back and to see how much is being accomplished uh, in this period uh, and how we talked about visions uh, earlier, how that vision of the late 1980s and early 1990s about the Central European University uh, is being realized. So what I wanted to to do today is just talk a little bit about the prospects generally uh, for the responsibility to protect the principle um, and give you my assessment of how we might think about some of the criticisms uh, that have been leveled at the principle. And then to talk uh, more concretely about its what I'm going to describe as its three pillar uh, formulation and particularly the, uh, the pillar one and pillar two agenda. Uh, that we're actively developing within the Joint Office at the moment. It's been almost a decade since member states of the United Nations endorsed in 2005 the principle of the responsibility to protect the World Summit of the United Nations. And as you recall, in those two articles of the Summit Outcome Document, Article 138 and 139, states declared that it was the primary responsibility of sovereign states to protect their populations for <coughs> acts, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and cleansing, including their incitement. Um, but also that there was a role for the international community should states manifestly fail in those protection responsibilities. So the responsibility to protect was defined somewhat narrowly, I think appropriately, as encompassing those four acts but also broadly in the sense that it was a very broad agenda which I'm going to try and elaborate. And the main point I want to make is that it, it of course, involves much more uh, than the use of military force under so-called Pillar 3. Since that time, since 2005, there have been a series of efforts to operationalize the principle uh, based on the implementation plan that was drafted in 2009 uh, by the Joint Office and, and the Secretary General. There's been the development of a convening mechanism within the United Nations around the principle, the establishment of a compact group, and of course, a great deal of activity uh, in civil society in terms of mobilizing support for the principle. We've also seen the responsibility to protect invoked in a variety of concrete situations of, of crisis, most notably, and for some, controversially, in the context of Libya in 2011. And so by the autumn of 2011, the Secretary General was confidently proclaiming, by now it should be clear to all that the responsibility to protect has arrived uh, as a principle. Now, despite that very positive landscape, I think there's been continuing unease in some corners of international society about 
how and to what degree the responsibility to protect should be operationalized, and in some quarters about its content. So at the same moment that many have been heralding the breakthrough of the concept, we've also seen concern raised about how uh, it should be implemented. And if you follow the debates in the Security Council <coughs> and the UN more broadly, following the military action in Libya in 2011, you will see some of these concerns expressed. And so the question really is whether the endorsement of Responsibility for Tech in 2005 catalyzed efforts to improve in concrete ways upon the international architecture for preventing and responding to mass atrocities. Of course, in one sense, they clearly did. In 2006, the Security Council endorsed Articles 138 and 139. The uh, General Assembly of the United Nations has accepted the implementation plan. And more broadly, we've seen the responsibility to protect become part of the world's diplomatic language, part of the normative framework for international actors. And it's been used in a variety of situations, not just in Libya, but in Darfur, in Kenya, and of course in Syria today. On the other hand, as I mentioned, um, there is continuing unease in some corners of international society. And I think to fully understand the parameters of that debate, we really need to unpack what's called the three pillar framework of the responsibility to protect. And so I want to focus on that for a moment. Pillar one draws on pre existing legal obligations, the responsibility of states to protect their own populations, whether they're nationals or not, from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. That's the first pillar. Pillar two calls upon the international community, acting through the UN system, but also partner organizations, to help states fulfill these responsibilities, building the capacity to prevent what are crimes? So in a sense, it's crimes prevention, uh, pillar two. And then finally, following the logic of Article 139, pillar three specifies that if a state is manifestly failing to protect its population, UN member states have a residual role, and they can respond collectively in a timely and decisive manner, but using the full range of tools at the disposal of the United Nations humanitarian, economic, political, and military. Now, the Secretary General regularly insists that all three pillars have equal weight in thinking about the principle of the responsibility to protect. Otherwise, it would be a very uneven stool uh, if one leg was more important. Uh, and it is also a multi-layered agenda that involves consensual means as well as coercive means. And I want to stress again, it entails a very deep commitment to prevention, which is often talked about, but rarely fleshed out or demystified. And that is what the office has tried to do over the last couple of years in laying out what prevention really entails. And of course, I know here at the Budapest Center, you are also concerned with, with that agenda. So if you think about responsibility to protect in that three pillar form, it's quite a complex norm in the sense that it contains more than one prescription. It asks states and organizations to do a variety of things. But there also remains debate as to when states have manifestly failed to fulfill their obligations and when that third pillar um, kicks in. And I think an example here is interesting to illustrate what I mean. Uh, so for example, in the spring, of 2009, at the height of the Sri Lankan government's military assault against the Tamil Tigers, advocates of the responsibility to protect engaged in a lengthy debate as to whether the approximately 150,000 civilians caught up in the fighting in the jungle near Mutabibu were being subjected to mass atrocity crimes. On the one hand, you have actors within the UN uh, calling on the Security Council to place this situation on its agenda and act upon the responsibility to protect civilians in Sri Lanka by dispatching an envoy to the region and considering the imposition of sanctions. Others, however, insisted that the Sri Lankan government was engaged in an existential battle with terrorists, 
that had threatened all of its citizens, and that it did not manifest with it. And as we know, there was very, very deep debate, and continues to be deep debate, um, over that particular crisis. Now, does this mean, and we might, we might also, uh, just as, as an aside, uh, give the example of Syria as well, in terms of a crisis that has raised the principle, but has also seen a lack of action on one of those instruments that is crucial uh, to the fulfillment of the responsibility of the the security council. So does this mean that the, that the principle is failing? It is not catalyzing efforts. I don't think so, and I think it's important for us to remember that military action is only one aspect of the responsibility of the tech. And so we should argue against the tendency to evaluate its strength in terms of whether we see the use of force. And there are various reasons for that. Firstly, as I suggested just a moment ago, the principle has three pillars with various prescriptions attached to them. And secondly, military force, and whether or not it occurs, is an appropriate test for the robustness of this principle. As a norm, as a principle, the responsibility to protect calls for action. It cannot dictate precisely what the robustness will occur for various bodies. There will be also a need to consider this norm alongside other <coughs> principles uh, and norms in international society. And so the decision to use military force, as we know, is a very complex one, which involves a variety of considerations about whether the use of that coercive means will be successful, what kind of effect it will have on the region, and indeed whether it's a last resort, whether all other mechanisms have been tried. So I think we should resist that danger of appointing uh, the responsibility to protect the military force. And so I would say to those who, who would claim the principles failed in Syria, for example, that the responsibility to protect has been acted upon in the crisis. It's been fulfilled by states neighboring Syria who have courageously taken in hundreds of thousands of fleeing refugees. It's been fulfilled by the Human Rights Council, which has passed a series of resolutions on the Syrian crisis, which has also sponsored a fact-finding mission and commission of inquiry, which is playing a very important role in providing a fact base for accountability at some point in the future. It's been fulfilled by states not acting through the Council, but through the EU in imposing sanctions. And it's been fulfilled to a certain extent by the General Assembly and other UN bodies in trying to sponsor mediation efforts. But it cannot, we cannot wave a magic wand and dictate what precise actions we follow. It is a catalyst, and I believe it has been a catalyst. If we think back to three decades ago, and we think back to the Balkans, it was much easier to argue then that atrocities and massive human rights violations occurring within the state was not a legitimate matter of international concern. Today, it's very hard to argue that. And I believe that the responsibility to protect, alongside other very important normative developments, is partly responsible for that shift. So let me, in my remaining time, say a bit about looking ahead to the implementation of the principle. Uh, its next decade, if you will. And I think pillars one and two will be particularly important here. Um, those of you who follow the September events uh, in the General Assembly will know that we debated pillar one uh, in September within the General Assembly, the responsibility of states to protect their populations. And the dialogue that we held in the General Assembly in September recognized the variety of ways in which states have, have sought to live up to their responsibility to protect. But we also discussed the risk factors that all states need to understand and assess in order to facilitate preventive action. And this debate and the report that uh, sponsored that debate reminds us all that the principle of the responsibility to protect is not only directed at building foreign policy capacity, but also critically at strengthening domestic capacity. And that no society is immune. We talk about Central and Eastern Europe as not being immune, given knowledge of its history. No society is immune from these risk factors. The question is how do we respond? the risk factors. 
We also are long, uh, during our dialogue in the General Assembly and in our report, a variety of things that states can do today to enhance their domestic capacity. They can create a national mechanism, uh, a national focal point for the responsibility to protect. They can engage in a national risk assessment using our diagnostic framework in the office or other existing frameworks of analysis. They can sign and ratify relevant legal instruments uh, which exist for the protection and promotion of human rights. They can participate in peer review processes. And they can form partnerships to enhance knowledge about these risk factors and build preventive capacity. And I'm delighted to hear that you are thinking within this region about truly regional uh, partnership, a uh, truly regional partnership for thinking about these risk factors. The goal of all our efforts, whether nationally or regionally, needs to be the creation of resilient, inclusive, and transparent societies. Because it is that trio, I believe, that will create both the capacity, but also the outward looking focus that is needed to ensure that prevention happens in a timely and decisive way. Beyond Pillar 1, the focus of my next year is going to be very heavily on the second pillar of the responsibility to protect. So how can the international community, I always put it in inverted commas because it can be so amorphous, this notion, how that community can assist states in their protection function. And here I see it as extremely important to counter the notion that somehow the responsibility to protect is threatening to state sovereignty. Because the spirit of Pillar 2 is to strengthen state capacity. It's to support sovereign roles and responsibilities. And again, to use a word I've used a few months ago, it is underpinned by a spirit of partnership between national authorities and regional and international actors. So the responsibility to protect is not trying to create some kind of hierarchical structure in which the international community stands above and outside of states imposing solutions, but rather is working to, to assist states in building their uh, capacity. Part of the Pillar to agenda, of course, uh, is about institutional development of the responsibility to protect within the UN system. And as special advisor, I'm particularly interested in exploring both the conceptual but also the practical links between the responsibility to protect and three other aspects of the UN's current work. Um, first and foremost, the human rights machinery of the UN, which we'll hear a bit more about in the panel. Uh, secondly, the conflict prevention uh, machinery of the UN, particularly in the Department of Political Affairs, and also the protection of civilians agenda um, within the Security Council and the In order to create more innovative and targeted approaches to pr protection within the UN, we need to clarify how an atrocity lens can enhance these existing agendas. And it isn't just conceptual. It's also embedding the responsibility to protect very firmly in on-the-ground activities and in political decision-making. Um, and that is my foremost priority. But you could transpose what I've just said about institutional development to other important institutions, to the EU, to the human rights machinery of the EU, to the conflict prevention machinery of the EU, and to the EU's uh, delegations as well, uh, in terms of its political. So I think as I suggested to you, the responsibility to protect is a multifaceted agenda. It involves many actors beyond the Security Council, which seems to have been the focus of so many in thinking about the principle with respect to Syria. It involves regional organizations, national governments, and crucially civil society, which is often on the front line in terms of observing risk factors and trying to mobilize national and regional and international actors. But it's also very much an individual responsibility. In thinking about this mandate uh, of the Secretary General, I often think that it includes a word that is extremely demanding, the word responsibility, which is both a moral and a 
people work. And responsibility for me, and I think for many, is a word that often applies to our individual actions, our need to be responsible. And I think ultimately the responsibility to protect does devolve to us as individuals to bear witness to what we are seeing, to try to catalyze action, and I think very importantly, to push for accountability whenever and wherever it's required. So I thank you so much um, for this opportunity to start off this important roundtable. Um, and I look forward to, to discussions with you both today and tomorrow uh, at the Human Rights Forum. Thank you. I'm afraid we don't have microphones for the audience here. Does no that speak up? Yeah. My name is Yoram. I'm represented here at the African Hungarian Union. My question is just when we speak about the international community, because several times we experience that in some situations the international community. The international community generally they don't take action when they should. You mentioned the situation of Syria. Now what we say is to thank Russia and China who said no to the action that was prepared against the people of Syria. And I am from Central Africa, a region where we are experiencing now also a real situation that needs responsibility of protection. But unfortunately, the so-called international community are just watching, assisting, and what we call implementation is not real. So when you speak about international community, what do you mean? Well, I think, uh, I think what you're suggesting, which is very important, is that there's a seeming inconsistency uh, to the action of the international community, that sometimes you can count on it and sometimes you can't. Uh, and what I was trying to suggest in my remarks is that I think we need to disaggregate the international community and get very specific about who we need in terms of bearing the responsibility to protect. So I see it as our role of uh, the joint office and the role of the Secretary General to be absolutely consistent, to call attention to both risk factors and the commission of mass atrocities wherever they occur. Uh, and in the sense, this is also the role of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, of Nabi Pillay. Uh, and you will see that we do that. We call attention to these situations. But then there are political actors which are mandated with the role of authorizing certain kinds of action. So again, I don't think the international community or agents of the international community haven't acted in Syria. They absolutely have. Humanitarian organizations have been heroic. The Human Rights Council has to the degree that it can fulfill its responsibilities. States that have been able have tried to impose sanctions, and although sanctions will not work if there are loopholes, you have to begin somewhere and try to stem the flow of both material and arms. The Security Council is the sole agent with the authority to authorize the use of military force. It has not done so. The most we've seen from the Security Council is actually a very strongly worded presidential statement in October, which was about humanitarian assistance and the need to allow humanitarian assistance. But, as again, I'd like to stress, the decision to use military force is a very complex one. And I think reasonable people can disagree as to whether that would have been a prudent thing to do in Syria. What effect would the use of military force have had? Uh, and I think we need to recognize that. So what I was trying to say in my remarks is we mustn't equate the international community with the Security Council's capacity to authorize a military force. 
there is so much more. Um, and there are ways we must investigate to try to hold the council accountable to a certain degree. Um, there are legal mechanisms for that, but I believe there has been significant pressure on the council to try to act collectively, uh, to try to bring about a political solution, and indeed there was some movement on chemical weapons. We also need to remember that we've been here before. Uh, we've had a United Council uh, during the last 20 years, the United Security Council, in many important instances. But if you think back, I think back, for example, to the Iran Iraq War. Eight years. You, unbelievable humanitarian crises and atrocities. And the Security Council did nothing for eight years. And so I share with you that frustration uh, that we can sometimes see this, this palpable in <coughs> uh, But what we mustn't do is equate the international community with solely that body. We all have to fulfill our responsibilities, wherever they may lie. Uh, my responsibility is to be a moral voice, to be consistent, to call attention, to try to mobilize action. But I cannot dictate, I cannot ensure that particular actions are taken. That is where we must all work to try to put, to try to bring pressure to bear. Finally, just a word on the Central African Republic, which I'm very, very glad you raised, uh, because it is a country which we are monitoring extremely closely, which we too are very worried about, um, and have called for greater attention. Um, and indeed, there has been more discussion and more about the Central African Republic in recent weeks. But I sincerely hope that it will not become another case uh, action that comes too late to save uh, in some lives. Any other questions? Okay, well, maybe we will begin our coffee break and resume back here um, in about 10 minutes or so. Okay, thank you very much. Research and cooperation of the Development Center. Uh, as Jervie uh, Tatar was mentioning uh, you earlier, we are now in the process of launching uh, a particular project on research, which is uh, the launch of our research center of excellence on R2P and uh, related issues, uh, which means that uh, we will try to. Uh, make our best to uh, have our research center able to host uh, scholars uh, in the vision of advancing uh, the responsibility to protect theoretical grounds. Uh, in doing so, we are uh, working with uh, several universities and uh, several national research systems. Um, the Academy of Science of Argentina, for example, is uh, uh, going probably to contribute with a scholarship to uh, give us a researcher full-time uh, that would come to Italy and, um, and research on, on various topics. And uh, the same will happen with uh, a few other uh, research centers, uh, both in Asia, Africa, uh, Latin America, and Europe. Um, having said so, uh, this is uh, a very wide panel uh, that would discuss the implementation of the responsibility to protect, or what the practitioners actually call the operationalization of the responsibility to protect, which actually uh, looks like a very bad word. In English, yeah, it's an unpolite word. But, uh, uh, but the idea is exactly how we uh, translate. Uh, Article 138 and 139 of the outcome uh, document that actually brought RTP to, to the core uh, of the debate of, of the UN in the last, uh, in the last 10 years. Um, and we have, uh, of course, uh, uh, an ongoing debate, uh, both at the UN level as uh, uh, Ms. Welch was, uh, was mentioning to you uh, that the interactive dialogue at the level of the UN is making uh, uh, 
people think more about uh, how R2P should be uh, uh, perceived by member states, but also by the civil society. And uh, of course, civil society is is a is an active player in the in the dimension of R2P. Uh, looks like more. Uh, it reminds me about the active role of uh, the civil society in the construction of the ICC as well. A lot of the efforts into the construction of the International Criminal Court were done by the inputs given by the civil society. Without further ado, I, I think that we, we will pass uh, the word to Ambassador Istan Lakatos. Uh, he's the Human Rights Ambassador of uh, Hungary, uh, now serving in the Hungarian Permanent Presentation of um, to the uh, UN in uh, in Geneva. Um, now I'm seeing exactly Ambassador um, Ambassador in the room. Uh, the mission of Hungary uh, in Geneva has been for the Budapest Center uh, a key partner in the last uh, years, and in particular in our efforts to bring. Uh, R2P and uh, mass atrocities prevention uh, debate at the uh, UN level in Geneva. And this is particularly in, on, on our efforts to uh, to help the process of, of uh, perceived by the, by the UN uh, uh, special uh, special advisors office on the on the prevention of genocide and R2P. Uh, to bring Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 at the level of, um, of, of the Geneva debate, so especially using the treaty bodies and, and the special procedures, uh, as well as the UPR, which we think that is uh, the core of the review, internal review process of member states uh, to acknowledge how far they are uh, gone into, into the RGP. Uh, just one last word about ISPAN. ISPAN has been uh, one of the key figures in Hungary to make the Budapest Center a possibility and a reality. And uh, I must admit I would be always grateful to him for, for having done so. Um, so Geneva, Geneva and, uh, and the possible role of the Human Rights Council in light of the report of the Secretary General on RGP is uh, your turn. Thank you. So, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, um, it's really a pleasure uh, for me to be here at this important round table and I'm particularly pleased to see that uh, this free event together with the Budapest Human Rights Forum became really a wide known now attended uh, international conference addressing uh, topical issues uh, in the field of uh, mass atrocity uh, prevention. And uh, I would like to pay tribute to uh, the dedicated work uh, by the Budapest Center in, in this sense, which I think uh, significantly contributed uh, to the widening of the horizon of the Hungarian uh, human rights diplomacy. And I think as a consequence of, uh, of also their activities, uh, Hungary is now well known as a country which is supporting prevention in general, but also the prevention of mass atrocities uh, uh, in, in concrete uh, terms, and that's what uh, our efforts in Geneva are aiming at. And um, not surprisingly, this subject is, uh, is also particularly important for the Visegrad uh, countries, uh, given the bitter historic experiences of uh, this uh, region. And it's extremely surprising to see that the voting patterns of these four countries are almost identical within the Human Rights uh, Council, uh, even when the European Union is divided. Because in certain issues the EU is divided, in Middle East issues, or there was a resolution on uh, Libya, uh, not, not the famous one, but uh, the following year. And, uh, uh, it was an occasion when actually the Visegrad countries who were members of the uh, Human Rights Council, which means that uh, Poland, uh, Czech Republic and Hungary, uh, actually prepared a joint uh, explanation of vote. Uh, and it was not uh, something 
pre-organize the thing, but it just we realize that actually our position is so similar that um, uh, we have to uh, articulate it um, in, in this way. And uh, it happened also uh, with regard to the Israeli settlement uh, resolution uh, also a few years ago. So, so I mean, uh, I would say that there is no uh, organized, institutionalized cooperation between uh, these four countries in Geneva, but I think that uh, the harmonization of the, of the four countries' foreign policy and human rights policy is not a big challenge because in many elements uh, they are actually uh, almost the same or, or identical. And uh, returning to my presentation, I, first I would like to uh, say a few words about the Human Rights Council because most of the people who are in this room are not uh, even uh, experts, although I know that there are a few people who, are, who came from Geneva uh, and, and who knows this, but I think for the uh, other part of the audience it would be important to say a few words. And then I would say a few words uh, uh, on R2P, but as Jennifer mentioned, most of the things from the political point of view, I just would like to address the R2P, the issue from a Geneva uh, uh, point of view. And then I would go through the tools uh, which are at the disposal of the Human Rights Council and, uh, and how they can uh, contribute or they should contribute to the first two pillars, so the implementation of the first two pillars uh, of the RPP uh, concept. And I would do this in light of the last, before, last SG report uh, entitled State Responsibility and Prevention. So to go through the policy options and the uh, risk factors and to see that uh, whether the Human Rights Council has uh, mandates or uh, what sort of answers uh, the Council can uh, give in, in this sense. So first about the Human Rights Council, which is uh, the most important human rights body of the, the UN. And it's an intergovernmental uh, body which was established um, in 2006 um, as the um, a subsidiary body of the uh, UN uh, General Assembly and as a successor of the UN uh, Commission on Human Rights, which was heavily criticized in the last uh, few years. So in, uh, after 2004, there was a process starting to try to uh, substitute it with another organization and uh, we ended up with the Human Rights Council, which in numbers a bit different because for the Commission, we had uh, three member states, now we have 47 uh, member states. Uh, uh, but uh, fortunately, the good part of uh, the tools of the Commission of Human Rights remained uh, in the Council, which means the, that uh, the special procedures, which I think extremely uh, valuable. We have a new mechanism, which is the biggest innovation uh, for the Council, is the Universal Review, which was already mentioned by uh, uh, UNSO, which is, I think, an extremely important mechanism because by this, in every four and a half years, all 193 member states of the UN, uh, of the UN should go through a general human rights uh, review. And um, we already finished the first cycle, so we are in the second cycle of this reviewing. So all UN member states have been once at least uh, uh, reviewed. And, um, and this uh, uh, mechanism, I think, could have an extremely important uh, effect uh, on long run because it's not it's not an, uh, a rapid uh, reaction uh, system, not like a special procedure uh, who can uh, you know immediately uh, um, visit a country. But I think in the long run, it gives a good uh, picture about the human rights tendencies in the country and also because other member states are make, making recommendations uh, to the country under review and the government should declare whether uh, they are willing to accept these recommendations. It also gives a certain responsibility we were discussing during uh, uh, your intervention. That I think in this sense the government has a responsibility to implement these recommendations and by the, by the implementation of uh, these recommendations they can certainly uh, uh, meet uh, all those challenges which may uh, um, end up at a mass atrocity in a, in a country. Um, and um, so uh, first, uh, I would I would speak a bit uh, now in, in details about um, uh, now now the uh, whole R two P uh, concept, how it was uh, perceived uh, in uh, Geneva. Um, in um, 
I think the problem was that uh, there was after the Holocaust there was no real discussion in international fora about uh, genocide prevention as such. The only discussion we had it was in the 90s uh, on uh, how to intervene militarily uh, in a country uh, in case of a human rights crisis. So it was the then unitary intervention uh, discussion. But this discussion was not about prevention. Uh, this was actually how we should react to a human rights crisis situation. And, um, and actually, uh, uh, the prevention, the concept of prevention was absolutely uh, not mentioned. But because this was the only discussion we had uh, before the r concept was uh, formulated uh, and was uh, in 2005 uh, adopted uh, by the UN um, uh, conference, uh, uh, you have, you have some, uh, many governments actually misuse this, uh, that the lack of information and confuse the two concepts. So they said that R2P is nothing more than a military, uh, than humanitarian intervention in a new modernized uh, dressing. And, uh, and I think that, that was a big mistake because as it was uh, mentioned by, uh, by the special advisor on R2P, R2P is much more than uh, just military intervention. This is the this is only part of the third pillar of this concept, and it's a last resort. But uh, of course, these governments uh, wanted to, to um, mix up the two concepts. They don't even mention the first two pillars and the importance of the first uh, two pillars, which was, I think, a problem. And also, uh, many countries always argue that uh, we shouldn't discuss r in Geneva because this is a topic for New York. We shouldn't uh, get involved in the GA and Security Council issues and things like that. And our group and the Hungary is member of the r Court group in Geneva uh, together with several uh, other countries like uh, Australia, Nigeria, Rwanda, Uruguay and uh, uh, formerly uh, Thailand. Uh, and um, uh, we, we discussed uh, this issue and we tried to convince our colleagues in Geneva that, uh, that the Human Rights Council and the whole human rights machinery, but even broader, the Geneva-based institutions should have an important role in the first, uh, actually in the second pillar mainly, uh, on the, in the preventive aspects and on technical assistance, technical uh, cooperation uh, parts. So, as a, as we see that the RPP discussion in the in 2009, 10, and 11 in, uh, in the GA actually managed to get a sort of consensus around uh, the concept, and it was not surprising that the U.S. Secretary General in September 2011 uh, mentioned that our debates are how, not whether, to implement the responsibility to protect. No government questions the principle. I think that was probably the highlight of the concept uh, historically. And, um, and of course, this uh, very positive atmosphere was reflected also in our discussions in Geneva, as in February 2011, during uh, the Hungarian EU presidency, the Human Rights Council adopted an extremely important resolution on uh, Libya, which was followed a few days after uh, by a resolution in the GA suspending uh, the membership of uh, Libya in the Human Rights Council. And then it was followed by the famous uh, Security Council resolution in 1973, uh, which actually uh, almost uh, copied some sort of text uh, language from the Human Rights Council resolution, uh, which contained an article language, which is very rare in the Security of resolutions, and, and then it was the basis for the NATO-led uh, operation, uh, this operation, and also the initiators, that uh, they thought that um, uh, the mandate was originally a civilian protection mandate done by the uh, Security Council, and the, the argument was that probably the NATO uh, overstepped uh, this uh, mandate. And then, um, uh, not surprisingly, a few days after the NATO operation, Brazil initiated uh, their uh, concept, which was a reformulation of R2P, this responsibility by protecting, in which uh, actually they focused more on the 
limits of the international community's ability uh, and not uh, on uh, and didn't emphasize the limits of state sovereignty. So it was a completely different uh, approaches and uh, they tried to make it more digestible for the international community. Uh, and we still have this problem in Geneva that although everybody is in agreement that the third, third pillar belongs to New York, but in case, even if, in case of the first two pillars, many governments are of the view that Geneva shouldn't have a role at that stage because there is no consensus within the GA uh, on uh, this issue, so we shouldn't discuss uh, uh, this problem. And uh, it, was, it was very well uh, seen, I mean, this uh, sentiment when um, um, a few months ago, Armenia uh, submitted an important resolution on genocide prevention, and they tried to inject a few paragraphs on R2P, but there was a sh so harsh uh, uh, criticism about uh, these paragraphs that actually, at the end of the day, they had to be all the references to R2P from, uh, from this, but at least we had a very strong genocide prevention resolution now, because it was, this part of the resolution was absolutely not attacked because of the R2P uh, part. So, so next March we will have an interactive dialogue on, on genocide prevention and a panel discussion on genocide prevention. So uh, in this sense, uh, genocide prevention profited from it. But unfortunately, we have to uh, uh, to, uh, 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 to continue our fight uh, for the acceptance of r 2 p in this uh, Gen Geneva uh, context. And. Um, uh, so now I, I would uh, say a few words about uh, the machinery of the Human Rights Council, which is, I think, important in uh, this sense. So first we have to uh, mention the special procedures. It's not very well known, but we have 37 thematic and 14 country-specific uh, mandates uh, uh, by, created by the Human Rights Council, which, which is enormous uh, basis <coughs> of information. So, I mean, you will see that every single issue you can think about uh, in the field of human rights is covered by almost by one, uh, one mandate uh, in the Human Rights Council. And these special rapporteurs have an extremely important role because they can uh, do uh, country visits, they can send communications uh, uh, to states on alleged human rights violations and conduct uh, thematic studies uh, and sometimes can be expert meetings and also annually they report to the Human Rights Council and most of them uh, report also to the G8, which is also important because it already gives the linkage between Geneva um, and uh, New York. So turning to the different policy options mentioned uh, in the SG uh, report, um, uh, first I would mention the concept building national resilience is one of the policy options mentioned uh, in the paper. And you can find here, besides constitutional uh, protections, democratic electoral processes, ensuring accountability, and an effective security sector uh, reform process, the importance of an inclusive transitional justice uh, process. And here, in 2011, the HRC decided to appoint a special rapporteur on the promotion of truth, justice, reparation, and guarantees of non-recurrence whose mandate is absolutely uh, in line with, with this task to deal with situations in which uh, uh, serious human rights violations uh, occur uh, or other great violations of international humanitarian law. And I think the special rapporteur, who is now a gentleman from Colombia, I think uh, can be very helpful in est establishing uh, an inclusive transitional justice process uh, in countries. The second policy option is the promotion and protection of human rights. Within this, you can find, uh, uh, as one of the important components, is the existence of an active civil society. I mean, recently, the Human Rights Council has done, a, I think, a really active and, and, uh, and very and, and proactive uh, role in many sense, uh, how to protect uh, the space for civil society uh, in Geneva and, the, and in the whole UN system. So we had, resolution by Ireland on uh, the civil society space. We had by our delegation or reprisal, so those who are cooperating with the UN and uh, because of this they are facing uh, uh, reprisals by the government. Uh, and uh, there, there was other initiatives because we felt 
that there is um, more and more um, attacks against civil society and tries to shrink uh, the space they have uh, uh, in the UN uh, system. The next policy option, uh, which uh, the, ne the next uh, item which is mentioned in the report, is the independence of the of the media. And we, in this context, it's extremely important that we have, for example, a panel discussion uh, on the importance of uh, media and internet, uh, and also the special rapporteur, Mr. Lam, who is doing a wonderful job uh, in, in uh, uh, this uh, sense. Besides this. Uh, uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, resolutions adopted by the, the Human Rights Council focusing on technical assistance. It's the so-called under uh, agenda item 10. And we had on Cote d'Ivoire and the Central African Republic uh, also. In this sense, it's important that the government concerned is cooperating with the Human Rights Council, which is, I think, an important uh, uh, parameter. The other one, as I already mentioned to the UPR process, which is an extremely important element, and uh, it had already a remarkable effect on the ratification of major human rights conventions by member states. Uh, I heard that more and more countries are ratifying uh, human rights conventions because this is one of the most obvious recommendations they are receiving from uh, other member states that, uh, that uh, ratify this or that uh, human rights convention. And then uh, we have the treaty body uh, system, and I'm happy that uh, Graham Salama is uh, with us, who is the director within the office uh, for the treaty body system, and they are doing an extremely important role in this sense because those countries who are going through the review by the tri treaty bodies on the implementation of the different human rights conventions, I think they have an extremely good uh, view and overview of the human rights situation, and they can see the uh, the early warning patterns, uh, early warning signs uh, in, in a country. And um, as I mentioned to you, the special rapporteur's work, uh, we should mention that 20 years ago, in case of Rwanda, the special rapporteur on torture and the special rapporteur on enforced disappearances already indicated that there is going to be a serious problem in the country. And then a few months ago, uh, a few months later, we have seen that uh, what happened. Uh, in Rwanda. So this is also a sign that uh, the uh, human rights, uh, uh, the special procedures have an extremely important role. And I'm sorry to finish because I know that uh, Enzo is looking at me. Uh, just just a two other uh, tools which are important. The so-called item four resolutions, which are for those countries who are not cooperating with the UN. I think this is also important. It's not as much for the prevention because usually you have already a serious human rights situation in countries uh, where you apply uh, this one, it was formerly Syria, uh, North Korea, uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, so, uh, but, uh, but also it can uh, prevent exacerbation of the human rights situation. And also we have commission of inquiries, which are also, uh, as it was mentioned also by Jennifer, they are extremely important tools for collecting the information on countries like now we have two, uh, one, one on North Korea and one on Syria, which are extremely important if you want to, uh, to uh, if you want to address impunity after the crisis, because then you have the information uh, of the people. We have also we have just emergency situations, special sessions. So far, we had uh, I mean you need 16 delegations to convene this, so it became a quite easy. Uh, uh, the, the usable um, uh, tool. So far, we have 19 special sessions, and six of them were on the on Israel and the occupied territory. Four on Syria, one on Libya, on the DRC, on Myanmar, Darfur, Sri Lanka, Haiti, Cote d'Ivoire. So you can see the major crises are covered, and we have two thematic ones on the food, uh, world food crisis, and one on the financial. Uh, crisis. So I thought that by this um, uh, very short uh, introduction, I try to uh, demonstrate that the Human Rights Council and the other Geneva based uh, agencies should have a more important role. They should be utilized by the international community. And I think by the appointment of uh, Alana Dieng and uh, Jennifer Rush, I think this cooperation between New York and Geneva is going to be even further strengthened, which is, which is I think, very important that we should see that there is one UN and not uh, two UNs, uh, one uh, in New York and one in uh, Geneva. Thank you very much.
what you said lastly reminds me of uh, the last debate that we had with uh, Jennifer uh, in Geneva, where I, had, uh, um, I was a bit, uh, I would say, forceful. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, and I responded to various questions about uh, whether the RGP debate should stand in Geneva or in yes. New York. And I said, well, the UN is actually one organization, it doesn't really matter where, uh, and, and we should envision uh, RGP as, as, a, as a product of the UN system and not as a product of the UN in New York, uh, which is very important. And I think in this, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely glad of the fact that uh, uh, we have a special rapporteur uh, on uh, RGP that is based actually in Europe and not in New York, because uh, this will help a lot. Uh, the differentiation of the fact that uh, RGP is not only uh, a New York, uh, and RGP is not only a, a New York issue. Um, without, uh, without going further on this, I, I, I pass the, the word to uh, Simona Lescovar, which is uh, uh, working at the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Slovenia, and she's the uh, focal point of, uh, for RGP in Slovenia. Slovenia has played a very important role lately uh, on RGP. Uh, in particular, they've organized uh, uh, the regional meeting of RGP people points in Europe uh, uh, earlier this year. And, um, and we are uh, working closely with them. Uh, I must uh, say that uh, our linkages of the Budapest Center with Slovenia are are kind of tight because uh, actually Slovenia was uh, meant to be the seat of the Budapest Center, so it would have been called the Ljubljana Center. Uh, at the beginning of, uh, of, of, of the whole exercise, when I was working at, uh, uh, together with Javier Solana, that was behind the initiative of the, of the construction of the center. So uh, eventually, then it did, we did happen to, to, to be based in, in, in Budapest. We are very glad of that. but. Uh, uh, we kind of remind always the, the fact that uh, uh, Slovenia has to uh, has to be in our hearts as well uh, uh, regarding our 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 history. Um, and uh, again, I think that uh, uh, the the issue of the focal point uh, is a very important one. Um, one of the things that Budapest Center is trying to stress a lot uh, uh, in this particular uh, uh, subject is the fact that. Uh, uh, focal points are not uh, the solution for RGP because the focal points uh, might tend to be a unique solo person inside one government thinking about RGP and uh, without having a national strategy on RGP, the focal point actually means almost zero because the representation of RGP uh, in, into the UN circles doesn't mean that actually a country is complying with the RGP mandate. So one of the things that we are really pushing forward and uh, is an initiative that we are trying to uh, take now with, uh, with Italy is to reflect on how uh, a national strategy should be built inside the country uh, together with the Ministry of Justice, with the Ministry of Interior, uh, with the Ministry of Social Affairs, uh, especially thinking about even about European countries, thinking about Italy, with the whole migration of uh, issues and, uh, and the responsibility of protection of uh, refugees, uh, that again is part of the R2P dimension in a broader term. So, just to let you understand that R2P is not just about genocide, it's about mass atrocities in general. So, also, the, the, what happens after the war as a consequence of mass atrocities fills in, into the R2P frame. So, uh, Simona Lesbor, the word is yours. Um, thank you, Enzo, and uh, I couldn't agree more. I'm also bringing in the New York perspective because I worked uh, at, uh, as a deputy at our mission for the last four years. So I can only say there we need to avoid overlaps in uh, discussing the, the topic at hand, but there are certainly uh, common ground uh, to work together regarding the RTP in New York and Geneva and in, in capitals uh, around the world. Um, 
let me let me start my brief presentation by uh, thanking the organizers of the conference, the, the Budapest Center and its partners, for hosting the event and inviting uh, also Slovenia. Um, uh, the four countries, Visegrad countries, and Slovenia. I think we have many shared views, uh, and human rights and prevention is only one of them. So. I also see here a common ground that we uh, work together and uh, try also to, to engage others, not only in the region, but also wider. Um, I would like to acknowledge the importance of today's debate uh, that brings together this wide uh, representation that is joined by the common interest of uh, advancing the Arctic concept. And I would like to thank the Jennifer Welsh uh, for the inspiring uh, messages she brought to us. And uh, I can assure you my country is full support in the future endeavors as a, a special advisor. Um, Slovenia has been a strong supporter of the RTP concept since, since the very beginning. Um, you might know that we were also um, co-facilitating uh, the two articles that were in the 138 and 39 that were in the 2005 uh, um, world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was asked to say a few words about the, the challenges of building up the R2P uh, focal point network and the challenges that lies ahead. So um, what I will say will, uh, with many words, be a repetition or well, I will just repeat or I can agree what Jennifer said before and what my uh, um, colleague before said, but uh, I, I will try to put a little bit of a national uh, view and angle on the, the presentation. Um, as mentioned in 2005, um, at the UN World Summit, the states unanimously committed to protect population from genocide, war crimes, and ethnic cleansing and uh, crimes against humanity by uh, adopting the R2P uh, responsibility to protect them. And uh, departing from the traditional understanding of a state uh, sovereignty, the states stress not only the primary responsibility of each other to protect its population from mass uh, atrocity crimes, but they also uh, stated that they need to assist each other in doing so, and as a last resort, to take a collective uh, action to prevent uh, populations from the greatest suffering. Um, while no notable steps have been made in the advancement of the RTP, as mentioned before, since uh, its conception in 2005, great challenges still uh, lies ahead in its full, wouldn't say operationalization, but implementation. Um, to make the promise uh, of the R2P a reality, um, institutional uh, capacities need to be developed at different levels, at the national, regional, and international level to prevent and halt mass, mass atrocities. Um, an important step that uh, governments uh, can take in this matter or in this direction by improving this intergovernmental and intragovernmental uh, efforts is the appointment of the R2P focal points. And that should be uh, some senior level officials to be responsible for the promotion of the, the concept, the R2P on the national level, and that they uh, support international cooperation in the issue through participating in the, in the global network. Um, this focal point initiative, the RTP focal point, point initiative, was launched in 2010, in September, <coughs> by Denmark and Ghana, in collaboration with the Global Center for RTP from New York. Then Australia and Costa Rica joined the organizing group, and at the present time, uh, more than, or I guess, 35 countries and some international organizations uh, representing all regions uh, of the world have appointed their uh, R2P focal points within their governments, uh, including uh, Hungary, uh, I guess, in April uh, this year, uh, and Bosnia. Uh, I'm just 
pointing a few because the afternoon panel will tackle uh, reconciliation in Bosnia. Um, two meetings of the of the global network uh, of the RTP focal points uh, have been taken place in New York in 2011 and 12 on the margins of the General Assembly. Meetings in September. Then the third meeting of the of the network was organized by uh, Ghana and Denmark this June in Accra. Uh, in between, uh, Slovenia, as mentioned by Enzo, uh, organized first regional uh, focal point meeting, uh, RTP focal point for Europe, in, in April uh, this year. This meeting in Slovenia was convened uh, with the aim to enable a broader discussion on the R2P in the European context, with a focus on the first pillar and the second pillar. And uh, uh, we also want to focus on the role of the uh, R2P focal points in implementing the, the uh, concept. Uh, this meeting in April also uh, enabled consul consultation process with the Office uh, of the Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide and European States in, in preparation of 2013 uh, report of the Secretary General on the R2C. A meeting uh, in April also affirmed the importance of the involvement of the civil society in the R2P discussions. So, um, talking about the, the challenges uh, ahead, uh, I, would, I can ask a, a question, or we, we all can ask a, a question, does RTP have a future? And uh, I can just second, I can only second what Jennifer said before, uh, there is a future for, for RTP. Uh, all the witnessing atrocities in, in Syria crisis legitimately poses questions. Uh, uh, and uh, um, we also said too many times in the past, and never again, and that perhaps, perhaps gives the critical and skeptical voices uh, reasons to question the very uh, viability of the R2P concept. Um, however, this gap between words and deeds should not serve as an excuse to scrap the whole concept of, of the R2P which I think uh, remains the rallying point uh, around the world to try to prevent the atrocities that still shock our uh, human conscience. RTP in its core is, a, is an instrument of prevention. Also, uh, UN Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon said that prevention is a key ingredient for a successful strategy for the RTP. And prevention of uh, atrocities uh, is a matter of international concern. We've heard before a question uh, regarding that, and I, I again, I, I just can, I, I can agree with Jennifer said to, to, the, uh, to the question posed by the gentleman about the uh, international community. Um, R2P has clearly animated the recent efforts to stop the worst from happening. Uh, back with the UN authority, uh, the strong support of uh, neighbors, the regional neighbors, and local civil society. Uh, international community managed to uh, proactively defuse situations uh, that were many predicting uh, would escalate in a massive violence and atrocities. I can mention a few like Sudan, Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, Libya. Um, and our goal should be to improve R2P's implementation, not get to rid of it. Um, but I think that the, the prime objective uh, of, uh, to push the R2P agenda forward should be uh, in, in first two preventive pillars. Um, we have to strengthen preventive capacities and early warning uh, mechanisms. And we can do that uh, also by uh, getting together, like uh, said before, Visegrad countries, uh, Slovenia, the region, the wider region. We have actively promoted respect for human rights. Uh, 
uh, and rights of national and ethnic minorities, uh, protection of most vulnerable groups, uh, respect of rule of law, enhanced dialogue, which we've heard uh, about it more in the, in, 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 in the future. I guess that, that's yeah. also one of the uh, topics for, uh, the, uh, for the future discussion. Education, to promote tolerance and understanding of the value of diversity, we also think it's of uh, equal uh, importance here. Um, we need to uh, give a strong support to the work of the ICC and uh, strengthen the fight against the impurity. And it, uh, it is precisely in this context that the national RTP Focal Point Initiative uh, has a decisive role to play. Um, they, the, the focal point should stimulate state-to-state -state cooperation and foster regional uh, efforts to improve social well-being, rule of law, uh, suppress dis uh, disparities. Um, I, can, I can share a few uh, actions or uh, activities that Slovenia is taking in this regard. Uh, together with Croatia, we initiated a process of closer cooperation and deepening of the trust among the leaders of the Western Balkans, that so-called verbal process. Uh, uh, that's uh, on the uh, highest political level, the presidential level. Uh, we are continuing uh, promoting and assisting in implementation of the RTP through our bilateral and multilateral activities. Um, because of the important role of enhancing uh, preventive strategies and peaceful methods of uh, resolving the conflicts, we decided to host a seminar on the mediation in this coming March, March 2014. Um, the seminar will uh, mostly focus on mediation in the Mediterranean, but it will also be an opportunity uh, for a, a, a regional uh, get-together and uh, countries of the wider Mediterranean region, including uh, Western Balkans, to, uh, uh, to see uh, how they can cooperate in this matter in, in the future. Uh, let me just uh, finish uh, my presentation uh, reminding us all about the uh, uh, coming anniversaries of the genocide in, in Rwanda and Srebrenica, the round anniversary of the Rwanda genocide, Srebrenica, the third anniversary of Syrian uh, humanitarian tragedy, that we should finally raise the political will to make a change once for all. I know it sounds um, um, very optimistic, but uh, we really have to do something uh, in this field. We need to learn from past experience and uh, ultimately acting in accordance with the R2P norms. Um, <coughs> and not to forget on some ongoing struggles to protect many millions of defenseless in places like uh, like Sudan, DRC, or mentioned Central Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon, for, for this insight. Um, I think uh, one of the discussions, uh, I mean, the, the key point for you was, um, I think, uh, is there a future for R2P? I think that uh, this was also at the end of the debate that we had at the World Bank uh, uh, Civil Society Week uh, just a few weeks ago in Washington. And the idea was uh, the future of R2P is actually to be incorporated into the development agenda. So that actually there would be no R2P agenda needed. Uh, again, it's for the never again uh, proposition and positiveness that, uh, that we all raised. But, uh, uh, let, let's hope for that. Um, we, are, we are now passing the word to um, Christoph Meyer, that is a uh, professor at the uh, King's College of London. And uh, more than that, he was uh, uh, one of the co-chairs uh, of uh, the Buddhist Center Initiative uh, to set up a task force dedicated to analyzing the capacities of the European Union into the prevention of mass atrocities. This has been uh, 
uh, a key, uh, I would say, a key document uh, that has uh, made uh, a turning point uh, in the debate at the level of the European Union, but I would say not only at the level of the European Union, as a result of the uh, task force and, and especially the dedication of Christoph and uh, Karen Smith, uh, which is uh, the other culture. Uh, we have put forward a paper uh, defining exactly the difference that intercurs between conflict prevention and mass atrocities prevention that was, uh, I would say, widely used by, by the uh, Secretary General in his latest report. Um, and uh, again, here, uh, our idea behind uh, the creation of the task force was exactly to empower uh, the, the discussion uh, at the level of a regional organization on how a regional organization, mainly the European Union, which is the largest donor uh, of humanitarian aid, uh, uh, was capable of doing something in the perspective of, of mass atrocities prevention. Uh, we are, uh, even the fact that we think that, that this uh, report was a positive one um, and, and that we have a lot of debate. Uh, we are now in the process of launching uh, um, an African task force uh, that would uh, actually try to analyze not only the African Union, but a set of uh, sub-regional organizations, because the African Union, Africa is a, is a, is a very complex scenario. Uh, so uh, we thought about um, also involving specific uh, sub-regional organizations and non uh, recognized organization like the International Conference on the Great Lakes Region that has been putting a lot of efforts into the advancement of, uh, of a system, of a regional or sub-regional system in the prevention of genocide. Um, and uh, we, we do hope that in the next uh, uh, few months we get the sufficient funding to, uh, to promote this initiative. Uh, and uh, because we, we really think that uh, it's time for the African Union as well, and for the sub-regional organizations in Africa to exactly reflect on their role, their capacity, and their actually with will to uh, further expand the, the field of, of mass atrocities prevention. And um, and I think that this report might contribute a lot to the setting up of the of the of the report and the, the interactive dialogue that uh, that we are hoping to have with, uh, with Jennifer on pillar two, which I think. That, uh, uh, is the core substance of, of, of this debate. So um, I pass the word to uh, to Christoph Mayer to present the results of the of the task force report and uh, and also the issue behind that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And so <coughs> and uh, also thank you again for um, the invitation to see uh, I think this findings of um, the work of our task force, um, Georgi and Enzo have already spelled out to some extent um, the purpose. Um, the task force is not just me and, and, and Karen, but there, there are 13 other, uh, top, uh, 11 other um, experts um, from across Europe who've been involved in um, uh, our discussions and who have contributed to uh, various chapters of um, the report, which you will find in um, the folder that you've been given, and it's also available for download from the Budapest Center uh, website. Um, it was indeed initiated and supported by the Budapest Center and began its work in 2012. The first purpose of our work was actually quite important um, and, and, and it involves trying to take stock of the state of the art on the causes of mass, atrocity, mass atrocities and genocide and what is it that we know about how to prevent and stop them. And, and, and this, is, this is actually not, this is, this is much more difficult than you would think, partly because um, cases of failure are studied quite a lot, but that doesn't necessarily give you a great insight into uh, what are the key factors that can help to explain when things work well, especially if um, that means that the event is not happening that you try to explain. So trying to learn lessons um, from um, the success as well as lessons from failure is, 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 is I think, imperative. Um, but I think that there's a lot of progress and I would recommend that you also read uh, maybe the state of the art section. Secondly, then, based on that assessment, we wanted to arrive at an understanding of the EU's collective capacities in this area to identify its relative strengths and weaknesses and to advance practical re recommendations on how the EU can better utilize its, its, its strength and um, therefore, hopefully, 
uh, uh, stimulate wider debate about this topic. So even though we're all academics uh, or uh, experts in various ways, um, and, and that marks us out a little bit from the US task force on the same topic, we very much hope that then other actors, civil society, NGOs, um, uh, officials, and politicians will pick this up and, 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 and uh, stimulate further debate. So what we've done is, is document reviews, interviews, and workshops in various capitals. And the report was launched uh, this year in March. Now, um, what, is, uh, what is our kind of key approach to us, or key expectations, is indeed that we have learned more about the, the, the factors that make the occurrence of mass addresses more likely, and that it is possible to design policies, particularly in the long term, to address those uh, risks associated with mass, mass atrocities. We also make the argument that there are substantial synergies between mass atrocity prevention and conflict prevention, but indeed there is a mass atrocity lens needed. It requires a specific perspective and a specific approach. Um, and we, 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 in the paper that uh, Enzo mentioned, we make the case for why, um, why a distinct approach is needed. And if, if uh, you want an example, you can look at, again, you look at the case of Rwanda, where the Arusha peace process uh, very much focused everyone's attention away from uh, uh, the rising risk of, of mass atrocities. And when the EU Council um, issued a resolution and said, look, these uh, 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 crimes have to stop, they also at the same time called on the participating parties to get together and solve the conflict. So rather than they're coming down very hard on the perpetrators, they kind of, we're still in this mindset of, of conflict uh, prevention and peace building and trying to get everyone around the table to negotiate when mass atrocities were actually happening. So it does make a substantive difference whether you have a mass atrocity lens or a conflict prevention lens. Now, what are our key findings? Well, one of the key findings is indeed that the EU has substantial strength in this area. It can offer something that uh, member states um, or states generally can often not offer. So it has very significant capabilities given its very large aid programs. It has structured long-term relationships with most countries on Earth and other uh, international organizations. It has, with the European External Action Service now, a network of 139 delegations, um, altogether 3,500, 400 officials working for the European External Action Service. It has a presence on the ground with about uh, 50 field missions, and it has EU special representatives uh, responsible for particular missions and with, with, with influence in, in, in these countries, and, and as a liaison back to major decision makers. So there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, capacity there, a lot of instruments available, particularly in the long term, to um, uh, implement a, 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 a to, to mainstream mass atrocity uh, lens for our policies. The EU also has, in contrast maybe to some member states, considerable staying power, i.e. when a government changes, it doesn't not normally change EU's, EU's kind of long term policies. And it has a lot of experience in conflict prevention and, and peace building, which is, as I said, uh, uh, an area where there are substantial synergies between uh, mass atrocity prevention, of course, many of these crimes occur during periods of conflict. Um, and the EU has improved its capacity to respond quickly to crisis, both by new financial instruments, such as the instrument for stability, but also by enhancing its uh, crisis response uh, instruments, the uh, common security and defense policy instruments, which do include, um, I should stress, a very strong civility uh, component. Um, and the EU, uh, on a strategic level, has a very, very strong commitment to conflict prevention and human rights promotion. It has been one of the main advocates of R2P in the diplomatic setting. And in some regions, some countries, it does certainly have a higher credibility as an actor than many states. Well, I, we think there are substantial strength that the EU brings to the table, and that can make it a, a helpful actor in uh, uh, mass atrocity prevention. At the same time, there is a substantial, what we call, underused, uh, underused uh, potential uh, of um, the EU. Um, first of all, even though you get uh, a lot of language in EU treaties and strategy documents about human rights, and to some extent also conflict prevention, mass atrocity prevention uh, or R2P are rarely mentioned in EU documents at all, neither in, in the security strategies, in council resolutions, uh, in programming documents, and indeed, R2P is, is not an integral part of the EU discourse in the way that it is in Washington, for instance. So they are very, very, in that way, the, the R2P and, and the mass trust prevention have not fully arrived in, 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 
in the, in the Brussels uh, a language here, yeah, either in the written word or in the oral communications and speeches. It is also clear that um, there's a lack of the massachusetts uh, lens in um, intelligence gathering, analysis, uh, and dissemination. Um, planning capacities are not really geared towards mass atrocity prevention scenarios and uh, uh, policy making and implementation in, um, in conflict prevention and human rights do not yet uh, include in a distinct way um, that attention to um, the risk of, of, of mass atrocities to occur. Um, thirdly, we feel that the EU has um, uh, slipped a bit behind in its um, uh, attempt to implement a kind of preventive mindset. And prevention in that sense really is prevention across all sorts of different areas of risk and issue, not necessarily about mass atrocity, but generally trying to uh, uh, tackle uh, the, 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 the upstream risk, trying to uh, tackle, um, trying to get away from a reactive approach towards a really generally preventive approach has been a major challenge for the foreign policy making. There is a strong tendency to focus on crisis management, particularly on the part of member states and the council structures. So whilst member states endorse preventive policy and conflict prevention in their uh, daily actions, it is um, the, the current crisis which occupy all the attention which can drag all the resources and, and, and therefore trying to move towards a generally preventive mindset and ring fence the right resources for prevention uh, is, uh, is, 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 remains a challenge for the um, and fourthly, there, is a, uh, there are problems of coordination within the EU um, that arise from the, uh, well, that are long standing in some, in some cases, but that have been also partly new with the setup of the European External Action Service. There are new challenges coordinating with the, with the Commission and the relevant, relevant parts of the Commission, particular development. And we also saw an underused potential for collaboration with local and uh, international uh, partners. Now, what is it that we, we recommend? We have a, a range of recommendations of what uh, we think uh, should be happening, uh, and I can't go through all of them. But um, our, our, I suppose our most our most uh, prominent most starting uh, recommendation has been that the EU should really play an active uh, role towards building a European consensus on how R2P is to be implemented, what it means, and and contribute to strengthening the international consensus after the fall of Libya and, and Syria. At the same time, it should address the current shortcoming between its, uh, its international diplomacy, its, its international support for R2P and its commitment to human rights, yet we don't really find this reflected in key documents. So we believe that an up update uh, uh, to the European security strategy, whether you call it European global strategy, should include references to uh, R2P, domestic trust and prevention and human security, and there are various ways in which um, uh, that focus can be included in some key documents where it is currently uh, missing. Secondly, we feel that um, the EU is uh, lacking crucial country and regional expertise, and that it needs to um, uh, strengthen that expertise through dedicated career paths to training programs or hiring in experts um, at the right level. Um, this is, this is very important, of course, effective warning is usually not database warning. It is, it is uh, warning, warnings that originally from individuals with credibility and, and individuals who can and give kind of context and, and qualitative assessment of, of situations and, and provide also options for how to react, particularly when it comes to more short-term short warnings. So, so yes, we believe there should be more collaboration between uh, early warning systems, as they are called, particularly on the collection side, but um, there are, uh, we, we thought there are also some risks in overemphasizing over quantitative approaches and theories and models um, because of the credibility and, and, and relevance problems. And also there are risks in, if, if, if you were going to homogenize the analysis, of course it's often conflicting interpretations, conflicting analysis that helps you to tease out your assumptions and some of these assumptions uh, may actually be wrong. So there can be a productive tension if you have different uh, sorts of analysis about risks between different partners. And then that can lead to um, challenging conventional wisdom about what might, what might happen in a given country. We also think that the EU needs to appoint um, some sort of special advisor for one in response to mass trust in R2P. It could be also at a director level, um, in, 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 the, in the sort of uh, managing director level in the EAS, and to establish very clear lines of accountability for either acting or not acting in the moment. Um, 
there should be, given that um, it often takes a long time for the EU and indeed any uh, Western state to react, more, uh, more effort should be taken to strengthen local capacities for direct prevention and uh, prevent the delays that may occur from waiting for the green light from Brussels. So empowering EU delegations, EU special representatives who are much more, much closer to the ground. And uh, we believe the uh, mass atrocity prevention that should be mainstreamed across the different uh, elements of policy, uh, development, uh, trade policy, and, um, uh, and should feature in um, the EU's dialogues with third countries, particularly where there's a risk of mass atrocity. So I suppose there's a, a boundary issue there between being uh, of assistance and exerting some soft pressure on these countries when they are not responsive to uh, 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 the populations. Uh, I could talk more about the recommendations in the different areas where we think action should be taken, but I think in the time I just jumped to the conclusion, um, which is um, to, to, to reiterate that um, efforts to enhance mass trust prevention um, are uh, in many ways, uh, uh, can, many, can in many ways also reinforce uh, the EU's foreign policy effectiveness. So, so even those parts of the EU foreign policy machinery who are not necessarily motivated by moral or legal uh, uh, imperative of ultimately mass trust prevention can be convinced that action can enhance, can enhance uh, uh, foreign policy effectiveness across a range of different issue areas. Um, we also think that the, the cost argument is not very, not a very good one if you actually look at, if you adopt a risk-based approach to uh, mass atrocity prevention, or you focus on those areas where the risks uh, are highest and where the EU can add the greatest value. However, uh, with all the institutional engineering and strategies, all of this will uh, have limited effects unless member states uh, and the council start to uh, send stronger signals and clearer signals about how prevention matters and how uh, 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 that prevention matters and how it matters. And that in turn will, I think, depend on changing the environment in which the debate on European foreign policy takes place. And, um, and, and it means that news media, NGOs will have to become much more forceful in making the case uh, for uh, a change in policy. Uh, of course, without these political incentives, without some uh, uh, visibility, without highlighting also success of prevention, we believe uh, that ultimately very little will change uh, in, 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 in the um, EU foreign policy machine. So, member states, member states' activism, and um, pressure from the outside will be crucial for making uh, any of these changes. Thank you, Christoph. I'm uh, exactly how you, uh, how you see um, the, the importance of pointing out exactly some practical recommendations that are viable options for action, so that are very sim simple in a way uh, for the European Union, uh, are something that we, we should uh, we should all go uh, for, and I think that. Uh, uh, eventually, uh, Africa will will be uh, uh, the African task force would be a, a, a step forward as well uh, in this direction. Um, we give word now to Senator Green, that is uh, the director of the Nansen Center for Peace and Dialogue in Oslo, um, and he will be speaking about the significance of dialogue in the in, in the prevention of mass atrocities. Uh, the Budapest Center has uh, opened uh, one of the, of the latest uh, projects uh, that we are exactly looking at is the, uh, is the role of dialogue as a tool for addressing mass atrocities. And um, in this, uh, we have uploaded an initial document for reflection in our website. Uh, I must say that the, the website will be soon updated. Uh, uh, I think by the end of next week uh, we will have it online, uh, fortunately, and, uh, and you will find there a lot of uh, documents, uh, uh, all our uh, video records and about our past events but, uh, and this event as well, and we, we aim at having as well a, a full report with your contributions and the contributions of the panelists about this event that we think that is, uh, is marking a step into into advancing on the reflection of uh, of RGP. Uh, without without uh, taking more time, uh, I will pass the word to Steiner and uh, on, on the vision behind uh, dialogue.
which uh, we really think that uh, um, something so productive for us. Thank you. Experiences with dialogue have to do with mass atrocities. But I work in places that have recently experienced mass atrocities like Svevenica, Vedo, Kosovo. And uh, <coughs> if I go back to the mid 70s, if people ask me, do you believe there ever will be mass atrocities in Europe again? I would say no. I would say we learned from World War I and World War II. So obviously I was wrong. And at least from the Norwegian point of view, we would say that we had a mass atrocity in 2011. A man bombed or tried to take down the government building only as a distraction to attack potential future political leaders. It's kind of presented in the media as a youth camp, but it was actually the future leaders in the Labour Party that were killed uh, that day. And uh, my base is the Nansen Academy in, in Villa Amel. We got involved because we hosted the Olympics in 94. Sarajevo had Olympics in 84. This is significant because we are not a humanitarian organization. We are not some international peace builders. So when we went to Sarajevo, it was with more equality and respect and a common experience of being Olympic hosts. And that opened the doors, I believe, maybe was closed to, to others. So we work in divided communities, and it means they're segregated. Segregated kindergartens, segregated schools, but of course the production of enemy images starts at home. Kids learn when they're two, three years old who their enemy is. And it almost to me looks as coincidental as if you were born into the North Mitrovica, you learn to hate Albanians. If you're born into South Mitrovica, you learn to hate Serbs. And unless you really honestly believe you choose your parents, this is so coincidental that it's actually tragic. And the propaganda is so strong on both sides. You are the victim, they are the aggressor. Unless there is some kind of connection, correction, dialogue, unless you hear the other stories. And at the moment, <coughs> people in Kosovo, even people in Bosnia and Herzegovina, don't. <coughs> The problem in a small town like Rosarama is not that there is so much hate between people, but there is so little interaction that the knowledge is minimal of how they others live, think, etc. So the places we would work would be Mostar, Mitrovica, Bukovar, Croatia, Srebrenica. And a lot of people say, you must have a very tough job, Steiner. Therefore, I'm quoting here Steve Jobs. He talks about simplicity. Simple can be hard and complex. You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple. But it's worth it in the end, because once you get there, you can move mountains. At the celebration of the Martin Luther King speech in Washington, D.C. on the 28th of August, Julian Bond, a very famous civil rights activist from those days, he says, white people tend to live over here. Black people tend to live over there. And as long as you live in separate places, you don't know each other. And of course, when we have this brutal segregation, the chances when people come along to motivate, mobilize for uh, mass atrocities is, uh, is much larger. And this is not only, as I see it, a Balkan issue. We had riots in London, in Copenhagen, in Paris, the killings in, in Norway, and the lack of ability to have a healthy integration policy in Europe is, uh, is a great threat for the future in this respect that we're talking about here. I use Villa Ahmed for everything it's worth, and we have invited more than 3,000 people from ex Yugoslavia to Villa Ahmed in the last 20 years. We started with, 20, with three months long conversations, and to sit and listen to people from Zagreb, Belgrade, Pristina, Sarajevo, talk about <coughs> the causes and consequences of the breakup of Yugoslavia was my learning experience into dialogue. I did this for five years, three months at a time, and of course, the first month, everybody believed they were born in the city of light. We have the truth, they are the victims of nationalistic propaganda. But slowly, slowly, slowly you realize that somehow there are things my grandmother, my teachers, my journalists, my politicians 
actually forgot to mention to me. It is worth to listen to those from Zadeo, those from Zaga as well. And then, when I talk about dialogue, it's a way of communicating that focuses more on trying to understand why we are so different, why we think so different about the same reality. And what dominates the conversation, also in Norway, is debate, discussions. You go into your position and you promote your own position, you defend your own position, and rarely is there any movement. We often hear about frozen conflicts, and my argument is they freeze because the way we communicate about them is unable to make any kind of movement. In a debate, we behave like a hunter, and we hear the weak argument, we move in for the kill. And we behave like moral judges. How can you support Norwegian membership in the European Union? Your father would turn in his brain. And of course, in a dialogue, you have to practice tolerance, self-discipline. In a debate, it's something very negative to change your position. While in dialogue, when you listen to other people, when you understand them better, maybe certain things make sense. Now that I listen to you, I understand better what you and uh, if we had known this is what we were thinking last fall, of course we would have acted differently. But in conflict, it's kind of crazy thing. We think we know what the other thinks. When I fight with my wife, I somehow want to leave the room because I think I know what she's going to say anyway. But while in, when in conflict, we have to become much more humble because maybe part of the problem is we do not understand what the others are thinking and feeling. We assume we agree on what we fight about. But that is my experience, it's not true. What do we experience? What comes out of the dialogue? Movement. The child, the curious child, is a perfect example. What does the child do? It asks questions and goes to bed at night as a different person. But when we grow older, we stop to ask questions because we think we know the answers. And when in conflict, the need to communicate increases, but the actual communication goes down. So dialogue is both an attitude and a way of communicating, and question and answers is the most essential part of a good dialogue. In every dialogue seminar I facilitate, this is the highlight. Each side formulates ten questions to the other side. They spend maybe two or three hours formulating the questions, and they spend two or three hours thinking about how they want to answer. And then it takes days to go through the question and answer session. It's a fantastic way of communicating, but we ask the questions too fast and we answer too fast. Dialogue is movement. Dialogue is visibility. I went down to the Middle East, actually last week, I was talking in Jerusalem and Bethlehem about the potential to have a breakthrough in the dialogue between Hamas and uh, Fatah. And we are communicating with the George Soros of Palestine that might even have a chance to become the next president of Palestine. And uh, I invited a few years ago five Palestinian filmmakers to come to Lulamek, show their movies to five Israeli filmmakers. And they said, no, why should we? That means to honor, to respect, and we don't. I went down, I sat with them for a few days, and I asked him, do you think that Israelis know how you live? Of course not. That's part of the problem. Israeli politicians, journalists, teachers, parents don't tell the truth. Well, shouldn't somebody tell them? And they said, yes, of course. But that's what I'm inviting you to do. Come and share your stories, show the movies. And they said, is that dialogue? We thought dialogue is what's going on at Camp David. And I said, no, what goes on in Camp David is in the opposite end of the spectrum of communication. It's a way of communicating where you actually fight for your positions and defend your positions. I'm only asking you to become visible. To organize a dialogue meeting about the conflict actually means not trying to solve the conflict, but trying to understand why the conflict is so hard to solve. And when they came, I remember one Palestinian woman got up, she saw an Israeli movie, and she said, I'm so ashamed to be 44 years old, and this 
was the first Israeli movie I ever saw. Dialogue is relations. We had a PhD in Norway. One very famous psychologist examined 75 leader teams, and his conclusion was very clear. Those who use dialogue, apply dialogue, build more trust in the team, but it's much more efficient in accomplishing, reaching their goals. Why? Because the alternative is often the authoritarian leader, not because the person is so authoritarian. He might just have, or she might have earned the respect, but out of respect we listen, we don't oppose. To have a dialogue culture means to have an opening for the different arguments, the different perspectives at a fairly early stage. And it allows more perspectives to come up on the table. So ask yourself, what is the dialogue culture like in your own working place, or for that matter, in your own family? Our strategic focus is very much, okay, remember now, we've been working for 20 years. The first five years, we were lucky recruiting anybody. I have the most crazy recruitment stories. It's difficult to recruit people to dialogue. But the last 10 years, we have been able to invite mayors, people in the municipal administration, directors of high schools, teachers, editor of the local newspaper. We work on the local community municipal level. The closer we come to the national level, my foreign ministry slaps me on my hand and says, hey, wait a minute, stop here because this is our uh, responsibility. The target areas are integrated schooling and uh, multi-ethnic local governments, reintegration of refugees in their own communities, and teaching and training, training of teachers. A basic pilot seminar would start with how has the conflict affected your life? The second would be to evaluate the ongoing inter-ethnic communication and cooperation, which often is zero in sports, in culture, in religion, in social life. Where you talk about it, something that seems normal to you is not that normal after all. But as long as you don't talk about it with the others, it actually seems normal. Even in Norway, one of my good colleagues was born on one island, and on his island, everybody were normal. But on the neighbor island, they only had one eye in the middle of the forehead. That rumor was there for the first 13 years of his life. This was before Facebook, when you can see people. <laughs> and then when he went to the mainland to start the secondary school, he met somebody from the island. And of course, it was a shock. This is a story all over Norway because of the troll and the one I trolled in, in our mythology. The third, identify the obstacles for integration. And when people start to talk about these things without us pressuring and pushing, things happen in the room. We just had a seminar in September about divided schools, two schools under one roof. I didn't say this is wrong. I just invited people to talk. What are the arguments for? What are the arguments against? And that conversation itself is very useful to start really talking about it. And then the follow-up, of course, who is making decisions? Who are keeping the kids segregated? And on what legal basis are you doing it? The challenge is very often how to create a wish for win-win. Because when you feel the victim, you don't want the other side to win. And you actually are willing to sacrifice a little if they only will pay more. Lose-lose is preferable to win-win. It's like a tough word in Norway. And of course, when you have your own ethnic truth so solidly uh, integrated in yourself, and you honestly believe the others are the aggressors, then it's very difficult to make movements to move forward. Dialogue is more than words. Just some recent results, and I'll finish. We have secured presidential support and the support of the Minister of Education to open a joint school for Serbs and Croats in Bukovac. Bukovac is the place where the Yugoslav wars in a way started. We are cooperating with the Minister of Education at Herzegovina to try to break down two schools under one roof. And I believe we will succeed. It's going to take a few years, but it's manageable. In Macedonia, we have several schools named nonsense schools. They're Macedonian, Albanian, bilingual, multi ethnic, and this has spread to the Turkish area, where Macedonian and Turkish are the two languages. And we even have been able to get small girls down from the hills that never had education beyond third grade to 
come down to the central school. And we have been able to support Serb return to Albanian villages in Kosovo. We have been able to actually be instrumental in establishing a multi-ethnic municipal government in Bjanovac, a Serb Albanian uh, government. We have supported uh, 48 Albanian families that live in a neighborhood in North Mitrovica. People believe Serbs are in the north, Albanians in the south. It's not true. There are 48 families living together in the Midas Hill neighborhood. We have spread the subject, cultural and spiritual heritage of the region in many schools in the Zukova region and in municipalities in Croatia, in spite of the opposition against the city. In Bukovar, we were instrumental in bringing down 11 years of segregated politics and supporting the new mayor that was elected on a multi ethnic platform. Also, this has had consequences for Norway. We are talking more about the need to strengthen our dialogue and culture between state, counties, and municipalities. Which executive boards in municipalities are saying we spend too much time fighting each other too little time developing good, solid policies for the citizens. And after the massacre in July 22nd, we organized open meetings in many cities. What is a dialogue meeting? It's a dialogue meeting where you don't meet a judge, you don't meet a moral judge. You're allowed to talk about your fear, you're allowed to talk about the feelings you have. And, of course, it's a job to create that atmosphere. But as with most jobs, when you've done it in 20 years, you learn how to do it and you accomplish uh, results. This is the model I'm discussing with people in Kosovo, with people in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have to understand the need for multi-ethnic state building. What does it mean? It means we have to realize what can we agree upon. Being Serbs, Albanians, Bosniaks, Croats, etc., we are all citizens of the same state. Human rights is a state issue. Territory is a state issue. Secure infrastructure is a state issue. Politics, protecting human rights, democratic elections is a state issue. The equal distribution of resources, opportunities is a state issue. The state is supposed to be run according to European standards. But in the same state, we have to allow for variety. Every third child starting school in Oslo is not ethnic Norwegian. And of course, you have to choose, let's say, the nation of your belonging and your soul and spirit can go in that direction, if that's what you choose. And of course, culture, literature, music, dances, food, clothing, you have to allow for the variety. We struggle with that in Norway, because the Norwegians being they own the country. The others are just recent immigrants, you know, they started to come 56 years ago. And uh, with that kind of attitude, it won't work. The reason for our success with integrated schools in Macedonia is that integration is not defined as assimilation on the dominant culture's premises. It's equality and respect. But when you are together, you become more visible for each other. Why is dialogue not accepted? Why is dialogue not down upon? A lot of the dialogue meetings that actually have happened, 80% have focused on the dialogue 20% of the follow-up. In our work, we spend 20% of the dialogue meeting and 80% on the follow-up. People have been too willing to recruit motivated participants without the authority needed, where they can implement what they see. Therefore, you don't apply to our we select, we invite. There is a confusion of political talks with dialogue, and there is also an unwillingness to include the extremists that you are afraid will destroy uh, the meetings. We include people on the extreme sides. And there is accusation, and you have to uh, discuss reconciliation. And as one uh, diplomat said to me, the problem with dialogue, dialogue is too womanish. <coughs> what women do. So, I'm finished. Dialogue is honest, open conversation. So, last advice to all of you, be careful before you try any of this at home. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senor. Um, I will. Uh, uh, I will. We, we will postpone like ten minutes still uh, before before we conclude the session. Uh, I wanted to uh, to give a 
last word to, to Laszlo Bayan, uh, if, if he wants to join us. Uh, he's the head of the Department for International Organizations and Human Rights uh, at the Ministry of Foreign He's is here to share. Uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Hungary, and uh, uh, we might just ask him a few words uh, on, on how he sees and uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, sees uh, the cooperation of the Visegrad Group in implementing the responsibility to protect. Uh, he's in the four departments that deals with human rights, so uh, he, he should, uh, I mean, maybe tell us a bit about uh, the vision of Hungary in this. Thank you. Hello, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, um, yes, uh, let me very well come in here. Uh, sorry to be late. I did my best. Sorry. I was supposed to be in Paris yesterday and today, but I went there. Um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, the Bilba Center for International. Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities for organizing this roundtable. That gives an opportunity for us, for, for us all to discuss such issues. And uh, concerning the, the topics you mentioned, uh, yes, I am I'm the head of unit within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the unit is called uh, Department for International Organizations and Human Rights. This practically means the UN Department. Uh, last year, I was appointed as the National Focal Point of Hungary for R2P. Uh, that sounds uh, okay, but it's not okay at all. Uh, I have to tell you honestly that uh, we are just at the beginning of the road. We know that our colleagues in Geneva are even more active than we are here in Budapest, or even our colleagues in New York as well. We are lagging behind, and this is not good. I feel the responsibility not just to protect, but also to do very much in favor of this topic. Uh, now, Vishakar, the presidency uh, gives us also an opportunity for cooperation. Uh, two colleagues should be here uh, who are within the Vishakar group and uh, with whom we hope to have a close cooperation. I personally was present uh, also in Slovenia. I don't know who is a Slovenian colleague. Ah, yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, that was a very good uh, event in Ljubljana. I, I, I just can thank for organizing this event. Uh, and then I could be present also in Ghana, where there was a global meeting of the r 2 How we should we should see that there are all together just uh, approximately 30, 32 uh, nominated focal points and the rest of the world is also lagging behind. Everybody considers this uh, initiative a very important initiative and we can discuss uh, topics, uh, what we can do and how we can do, but uh, concretely I was very impressed by our Danish colleague, for example, who organized in Ghana together with, with uh, the government of Ghana, this uh, global focal point uh, evil. I can see that those uh, countries who are, let's say, richer, have more opportunities to be active worldwide. Here in Hungary, with this uh, genocide prevention center, we can also do uh, our best in order to be active in this field, and I can see that uh, the center does its utmost to be active and to do research work and uh, afterwards to get this research published. Uh, still, as far as I myself am concerned, as the global, uh, as the focal point here, I'm just looking for the possibilities. You should know, I don't know whether this was mentioned or not, there are two museums here in Hungary. One of them is the House of Terror that is dealing with the uh, uh, atrocities during the communist regime. And there is the Budapest Holocaust Museum, uh, which deals, uh, of course, with the Second World War and with the mass murdering horrible things of the Second World War. Uh, I had in mind to get in touch, no, sorry, I, I didn't mention it correctly. I was already 
in contact with the, with the director general of the Budapest Holocaust Museum. And my goal is maybe to, to, to ask him whether in the museum there would be, let's say, a room uh, possibly open for other mass atrocities and genocide in the world. But I can also understand if uh, my request would be rejected. Because they can tell and they can see and they can have their opinion that you know, this Holocaust Museum is just for a memorial of the, uh, of the, uh, of the people of the Second World War and, and uh, nothing else. I think it would be very generous from their side if they would offer this and if it's, they would be open to have such a, let's say, one room within the museum. And then, let's see what we can do with the Wishagrad countries here. Honestly, we have no cooperation in that way actively. Uh, what we could feel also in, in, um, in Ljubljana, that people were discussing, it was extremely interesting for me to see this uh, activity uh, that was done by our Slovenian police. And I would be also glad somehow to to stay in the line and to continue that way, but uh, honestly, I'm just looking the ways what we could do. Um, I didn't want to. I didn't want uh, you to tell great stories what we have achieved because we haven't achieved in that way. Let's say within the ministry, too many things. But I feel the responsibility, and I'd like to to be active, and that's why I. I think that these uh, opportunities are good. It's a very interesting thing that uh, I don't know, most probably in the neighboring countries, that that happened to all of, uh, that happened in all of the neighboring countries, that uh, those people who belonged uh, before the Second World War to the noble society, to the rich people, to the, let's say, elite class, these uh, people were deported. and. Uh, uh, they had lost uh, all the uh, things, their houses, their flats, their, everything that they had previously, and they have to go to the countryside. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting that right now, if you would ask someone here in Hungary, even a, a student in a university, what he or she does know about this period, and what was this period of, let's say, deportation of people from the past. A very, very few percentage of the students, of the university students, would be aware of the situation, and a great uh, number of them would say that, okay, sorry, I don't know anything about this period. And this is a shame, and we have to know the past. And in that way, I, I think that also for the Holocaust, for me it was shocking when the Iranian president uh, denied the Holocaust itself. So how can, let's say, an intelligent person be like this? So I think that one of the, or one of our responsibilities is really to get people new of the past, and even in Sikavenica, and, and also that all these mass atrocities that could happen and that will happen in Unfortunately, uh, I'm sure it will happen in, in Africa. We have to feel all the responsibility to, to know at least <coughs> what is going on and to do on our level the best what we can do. But I can also ask your view what you would suggest us to, to do and where to be more active. I think that the most important thing is really to make people aware of this genocide uh, uh, that happened in the past, and uh, all the people that he united not to have this again. For, for us, I mean, it was shocking that, yes, in 1995, this terminality could happen. And it was just in the neighboring country. Nobody could have stood on, on such a possibility, and it happened. So, uh, unfortunately, I can't tell you anything more positive. I can't tell you anything that I personally have done in this field. I can just promise you here that I will do my best uh, 
uh, to be active and in a certain period I hope that uh, we can also uh, see some real results of our activity. Thank you very much and I wish you a, a good afternoon. I, I, I might, uh, may add um, that I think that uh, a lot of positive action has uh, actually been done. Uh, Hungary is uh, still behind the promotion of the of the creation of the Budapest Center. Is, is supporting the Budapest Center, which I think that is uh, ultimately something that is very positive, uh, not just for Hungary itself, but I think for the whole uh, region. And uh, and again, I think that. Uh, by the fact that uh, Hungary has appointed uh, 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 an RGP focal point uh, already is, is a positive uh, uh, advancement. I think that, uh, as, as we were mentioning before, uh, a lot has to be uh, done in the field of building the national strategies that would accompany the, the RGP focal points in their, in their nations uh, to be more proactive internally and not just uh, acting at a global level, into discussing what RTP should be, should be uh, or, or not be. Uh, I, I just would like to, to give uh, uh, a word to uh, Ambassador Anders uh, from, from which is the Hungarian uh, ambassador uh, to the UN in Geneva, uh, that might add a few words as well as, uh, as uh, Mr. Bayan was, uh, was mentioning the role of, of uh, Geneva uh, and the Geneva mission of uh, Hungary uh, in support of, of his work and the uh, RGP work uh, for Hungary itself. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, just to add to what British one has said, uh, we, uh, uh, we are working on, on the whole spectrum of prevention as well, whether this is tied to what could be or not is of my uh, the job to decide, but I think every prevention can be tied, every preventive activity can, can be linked to activity anyway, even if our initiative is not only to activity per se. Uh, together with the 22 other uh, member states, uh, uh, members and observers of the Human Rights Council, I sent a letter to the President of the Council to ask for a scene in the mainstream debate that used to take place and in March uh, at, during the high level segment of the Human Rights Council. And the theme of the debate is decided during the previous year so as to be able so as so as the Secretariat to be able to invite the high level officials. Uh, we, we suggested the theme of prevention. And uh, we managed to assemble uh, uh, these 22 delegates uh, from across the globe. So every regional group was represented and we sent it to the president. And just one day before the deadline, uh, the African group uh, assembled and, and they came forward with their own suggestions with migration. And at this point in time, so we are still discussing, and the president is, is very much willing to make a decision that should be consensual in principle. Uh, uh, whereas our proposal is a, is a much original proposal, we were trying to, to, uh, to have an honest deal uh, with the Africans so as not to create them. We don't want to go against our African friends, uh, not here and anywhere else either. Uh, so what uh, what is formulating as a possible consensus now is is to have a mainstream debate that is a UN system wide participation during the high level panel uh, on in one session and afterwards uh, uh, might be a, an interactive dialogue on uh, migration. So that's the president's suggestion, and we certainly support that. Uh, so this, I just wanted to mention that that uh, we are still. Find, trying to find ways to promote implemented aspects of of, uh, uh, of the UN's uh, system by approach, uh, which is in our view is very important. Thank you very much. 
Okay, I, I will just pass the word to uh, Ibrahim Salama, which is the head of the Human Rights Street Commission of the House of the High Commissioner. Thank you very much. I'm just taking the opportunity of the generous uh, offer by Mr. Bayan to answer the thing of the fundamental question. What else to do? What can we do better? Just a personal reflection to say that looking at the dots and the dots and, and the work is doing in the world. Uh, I think that there, is, there isn't enough uh, link currently in Geneva, despite the best efforts of Ambassador and New Mission and many others and across the EU uh, who work on, on the approach of prevent preventive diplomacy to, to my, uh, avoiding violations and lesser processes. There isn't enough links between this and the strengthening of the human rights and security mechanism. You have a fundamental post of the system. You have constant review of the Human Rights Council and mechanism. You have constant debate on the UPR efficiency and the policy issues that remain. Unless and until these two issues are linked, we will keep proliferating uh, initiatives trying to do the same thing. But I think of in that sense because I think each and every method has something, provided that we link the dots between them. And I think this is not being done. Part of the problem is that issues have different names and the people in different mandates do not, do not meet each other. I was struck, for example, that the human rights mechanisms do not meet each other because it's not conceived to be a system. The world treaty body system of <coughs> naked architecture. We are inventing them diplomatically, but they are not conceived as such. And I like very much the notion of the Hamor who took yesterday with Jennifer of pre political and basically institution being engineering. And I don't think this is being done enough. I have no judgment on the idea of the recommendation, for instance, of adding an EU uh, special advisor. But the problem with adding mandates without having this link dots is that you, you contribute to a certain confusion or at least a diffusion of the impact of the actions. So just a call to reflect on the existing mechanisms, how to strengthen them within the mandates, and how to demystify the links that should exist within them. Thank you very much. I often hear people say, this is my own dialogue. Mm -hmm. And uh, in those cases, I would always say, well, it can't get worse. We, we try. Uh, in in Oslo, we have a B gang, A and a B gang. They killed each other you know, in the street. Not, not uh, high numbers, but they killed each other. And uh, there was an interview with one of them. And he said, well, the police uh, thinks it's only a question of getting more weapons so they can control us. Why don't they understand we need to talk to each other? So I've always argued that if we're trying, but of course, when the plane is approaching between towers, it's, it's too late. And uh, there are times it's too late. When the Norwegian man went uh, on his berserk, so it was too late. But 10 years earlier, if he had been included in some activities, conversations, to avoid living in that kind of lonely bubble, then maybe that mass atrocity could have been uh, prevented. So my answer is, it's never too early. Yes, it is sometimes too late, but that's only an argument for starting earlier all over the place. Any other question? Yes. Um, I just have a question for uh, Ambassador Vistamadabakos. When he spoke about uh, uh, the independence of the media. Uh, I would like to know if uh, the media in general is really playing the role they should do in order to help, for example, the promotion of human rights resolution. Thank Uh, in a country. That's why it's important that it 
to go independent uh, and not uh, uh, implementing a political agenda uh, of someone. Uh, so I think uh, the objective uh, information is one of the, the best tools to make uh, uh, good decisions. And I think this is important, and, and this is a right to the population uh, so that, uh, to get uh, uh, this information uh, available for, for them. Because sometimes, of course, uh, in many countries, you should uh, read uh, the news uh, uh, in light of uh, the political affiliation of the different media uh, organs, which is, I think, uh, not, uh, not always the healthiest uh, uh, way. But what, what we realized is that the internet became actually an extremely important tool for the promotion of uh, protection of human rights. And you could have seen this uh, during the Arab Spring uh, in, in Egypt and the other countries, that uh, how uh, influential the media uh, was. And uh, we, are, we are always saying that you should apply the same rules for the uh, internet as for the other media. So, because sometimes uh, of course government, uh, uh, I think there are 40 governments actually right now in the world which is uh, using censorship uh, on the internet. Uh, uh, and which, which I think uh, quite alarming uh, number, and, and this is I think vital that we should uh, have more freedom uh, for the internet, uh, which is which is a fantastic opportunity for the whole public uh, uh, to get uh, credible information on the situation of their own country in, in, in many instances, but also uh, it's important for network uh, networking uh, for those who want to do. You know, a promotion of the human rights focus uh, they can have the networks uh, via the internet, which before then uh, didn't exist. So, I mean, before that, it was much more difficult to organize human rights uh, uh, group, uh, for example, for, for certain uh, causes. Now it, it's much easier uh, via uh, emails and uh, internet uh, to use this. So, I think that this is an opportunity which should be used. Um, if I just may um, think about something that was mentioned by Ibrahim, I think that uh, your point about uh, not adding uh, a new mechanism is important. But at the same time, um, I had this uh, before joining uh, the Hungarian Ministry of Foreign Affairs into the exercise of uh, creating the Budapest Center. I was in the core of the European Union system uh, trying to uh, sort out who should have been capable of responding to RGP or to genocide prevention as a, as a broader thing. And I, I remember uh, uh, when, when I was called by, by Javier Solana to, to actually mandate as, as a coordinator of the EU program for the prevention of genocide at Latin conflict. So we, mass atrocities was not there yet. Um, um, I remember having uh, uh, our first meetings with, uh, within the circles of the European Commission. The external action service was not there yet. And there were five departments uh, of the foreign affairs uh, uh, session of the European Commission in front of me. So there was development, there was uh, external affairs, there was ECHO, there was uh, uh, a lot of them because it was a cross-cutting issue. But the cross-cutting issue was actually meaning that no one was actually taking the responsibility out of it for it, to respond to it. So one of the outcomes, I think, that, that is very important of the, of the recommendations of the EU task force reports is not to create a new mechanism. It's to create actually the responsibility between the existing mechanisms, which it actually seems completely different to, to, to my, I mean, at, at least in my view. Uh, uh, is, is not to uh, make a new burden to the, uh, the European Union uh, uh, institutions, uh, but is actually to be a bit more rational in understanding that by using a mass atrocity lens, you're actually much more able to respond practically to threats that you will in any way be willing to respond to. The only thing is the capacity of being able to respond in the most proper, proper way and actually in the most preventative way possible. 
uh, we, we, we were always talking, and, and this was a, a general attitude that we were also having with, uh, uh, in, in our work when, when we were uh, doing uh, this exercise together with the Folkebern about the Academy in Sweden. Uh, and I remember the magic words of uh, Ambassador Ragnar Angerby that were viable prevention policy options. So not prevent prevention options that might be like some war. I mean, this is not, it's maybe it's not viable, but then it, it, it would be, have been viable, I mean, to, to think and, ana and, and have an analysis of what was happening in Libya after Gaddafi was killed, because the majority of the massacres happened after Gaddafi was killed. We, you have a lot of retaliation, a lot of revenge, which is actually what we are trying to as a percent we are trying to act in, 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 in Syria exactly to respond to those threats. The threat of retaliation that is actually a big part of the, of the threat to mass atrocities uh, occurring in the country. It's not, it's not just what is happening at the moment, but what, what is coming next? And, and it's, all the, it's, it's exactly to link again with the, with the whole RGP debate. RGP is not just on, on the making of mass atrocities, but it's way behind uh, or before mass atrocities occur. So it's uh, tackling with, uh, with the fragility of states, tackling with the fact uh, that you have a uh, transitional state that are, that are passing from maybe an authoritarian regime to, to, to a democracy. And in that period of instability where you have elections, and uh, we were talking yesterday about uh, the situation in Egypt, but as well the situation in Palestine, uh, and, uh, and the whole situation that relates to, to the linkages of uh, mass atrocities and election systems as well, and democratic change. And so uh, I think that one of the, uh, of the things that was more, most important in, in the whole uh, debates that we had in the, in the EU task force was also uh, uh, the very uh, basic knowledge that uh, uh, the European Union is actually demanding while operating in, in third countries, there, it, it's demanding for something. Okay? It's, it's, uh, it's putting a compulsory requirement on the state to actually facilitate something. So facilitate uh, democratic change, uh, 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 a new judicial system, etc. etc. Well, even before that happens, one of the preconditions of the state it should be to to be a non-active state in prevention of mass atrocities into a proactive state towards prevention of mass atrocities. I, I will never stop thinking about the examples that I, that I always had uh, as, as in the European dimension. I, I think about my, my home country, Italy. Uh, for us, it was a big step to uh, require the use of helmets while riding markets. And the basic requirement in prevention, the prevention law there, is to actually convince the citizens to use the helmet before starting the engine of the market. Because when you are riding the market and you are about to, you, you actually, I had an accident myself by riding a market in Rome, which is actually normal. But, uh, it, you actually notice that you are going to crash. You you have the, the the flash on your eyes that you're you're about to crash. And in those ten seconds, you don't have the capacity to just stop the muppet, go behind the, the seat of the muppet, take the helmet, just put your helmet on, on and just crash and then uh, survive. Uh, this is not possible. I mean, it's, uh, the, 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 the the capacity of early uh, uh, I mean, of late prevention is, 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 is a no possibility of, of, of being a successful one in the majority of the cases. Maybe, sometimes it is, but uh, uh, if, you, if you don't produce as, as much as possible prevention options in the early stage, you're, you're, not, you're not being able to implement, uh, especially the first and the second pillar of r that are something that we might focus on on r in Europe at the moment. Because we, we think about the complexity of, of getting uh, the Roma population integrated in the, in the European society. And after 
50 years we are still not there, which is actually failing into our capacity of being a preventative uh, uh, regional framework. You know. Sorry, to be that long. <laughs> Can I just say one sentence? I like an analogy with the helmet, but I think the helmet in this case that would usually strengthen the mandate of RGB is to convince all states to have a, a, an open invitation to all special rapporteurs, to ratify all conventions, to report on time, and to properly use all the human rights figures. If you do so, you will automatically have fresh enough uh, in advance information, and this is the helmet in this case. And I think the fact that there is no link between the mandate of RGB and this helmet tripartite element of invite to ratify the fourth of time that creates uh, a device which is very easy to bridge in my view. Yeah. But because the mandates are different and parallel, we don't make the rules. I totally agree. Okay. We, we, we will resume this session now and uh, we will have a lunch uh, session uh, for about uh, 40 minutes and then we resume with the second panel. And uh, uh, my pleasure. I thank you all the panelists uh, for being here and uh, sharing with us uh, insights about uh, the implementation of our Thank you all. Good afternoon. Can we start? Allow me to introduce myself. Unlike in the program, my colleague Alan Pieski from my university, from my department, could not come. My name is Christoph Jelitski. I am a professor of public international law at the University of Gdańsk. At the same time, I am a legal expert at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, dealing with human rights, just to tell you that some 10 years of my time I spent as an agent of the government of Poland before the European Court of Human Rights. Thus, as you know, losing a lot of cases, but also winning not a bad proportion of uh, those cases. Uh, what brought me here with pleasure to accept this uh, proposal uh, is that I have had uh, also seven years experience in my work as a senior legal advisor at the office of OSE High Commissioner of National Minorities in the Hague. Those who know institutional framework of the OSE, this uh, arrangement of High Commissioner of National Minorities which is deliberately chosen, was not for national minorities, but on national minorities, is a classic conflict prevention and early warning institution. And uh, as a lawyer, I have learned that a lot, including my legal background on human rights, but also learning a lot how conflict prevention looks like, should look like, and how it can bring about some good results, and I'm glad that this is a part of this debate, to see it. I was uh, offered to chair a panel two. Uh, its task is promotion, reconciliation, relaxation, processes by the Visegrad group in Bosnia and Herzegovina in the aftermath of genocide of Srebrenica. So I believe that after introducing us on implementation, Panel one, and with a lot of optimism, produced by Mrs. Uh, Jennifer Welch, I believe with her, with her rather over optimism about a lot of things she told us about. Let us here at this moment try to study a sort of case, case of uh, Bosnia Herzegovina challenges there in this particular context of post-genocide time in Srebrenica. Uh, as you know very well, this is an attempt in reconciliation in the country. 
Uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina as a state entity, let's say this way, legally speaking, is in crisis. Some people say it is in a deadlock, or rather black hole. Crisis mainly comes from specific conduct, result of conduct by public authorities. Uh, the society as such has enormous difficulties to stop thinking only in terms of <coughs> ethnic origin of the group. So each representative represents specific ethnic community. <coughs> Not big successes in multi-ethnic arrangements, institutions, organizations, but they are endeavors to that end. And still, civil society as a whole, be it ethnic, divine, or otherwise, is not sufficiently strong. But there are some symptoms of uh, improvement. I read about the case of uh, difficulties by public authorities of Bosnia and Herzegovina to adopt a law on personal number, code number. One of the reasons for which a child could not uh, be treated medically abroad, and this provoked demonstrations. That's, I believe, a very, very good symptom. I have uh, four experts with me. I'm glad to see them here. And I will give them, sorry for this strict approach, about 15 minutes each. Because after 4 o'clock we may be kicked out of the room. You should know. <clears throat> and asking them to point to their own submissions they have prepared in advance, while thinking at the same time how this case study may bring us some uh, thoughts about conflict prevention, early warning, the whole reconciliation process. In the OLC panels, <coughs> you are using terminology based on these three stages. First, conflict prevention. Second, when conflict erupts. This is conflict management. In some way you must, as a community, must manage the situation in order to calm down. And then uh, you start post-conflict rehabilitation process and stabilization. And this is the stage at which Bosnia-Herzegovina still is, and it goes back to conflict prevention in order to avoid tensions and conflicts at higher level. Allow me first to introduce uh, Zorica Malic Djordevic, ambassador and permanent representation of Montenegro to World Trade Organization and to Human Rights Council. Zorica is a public servant, was a Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Chief Advisor to the President, and Prime Minister. Hopefully, they will have a good future with the students of yours. And we will hear her submission on the importance of mass atrocities prevention, how to be in the Balkan region. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Jelitsky. Uh, let me first uh, thank Dr. Yevon Center for the uh, International uh, Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities and Central European University for hosting this important event. I would like also to thank uh, um, the mission uh, of Hungary to the Human Rights Council of the UN in Geneva for uh, their kind invitation and excellent work and leadership at the Human Rights Council. Uh, prevention forms uh, an integral part of the framework for responsibility to protect. Every action taken to address incitement to violence and specific risk factors for atrocity is an important step in ensuring that responsibility to protect is effective. In what however these instances where prevention has failed, the dire consequences that conflict can inflict upon state 
and its citizens are currently being played out in places like the Syrian Arab Republic. Even after two decades, the consequences of the brutal war during the breakup of Yugoslavia are still visible. They define the lives of several generations and uh, was felt throughout the region. Lack of political leadership is built to accept responsibilities, to provide dialogue and support uh, initiatives for the right to truth, had slow, slowed down the process of initial <coughs> reconciliation. Or collect the instruments of stability and security that would in the long term prevent or provide prevention to the conflicts and mass atrocities. What is the answer? Of course, uh, R2P is one of the effective instruments uh, that we are introducing and try to uh, get around it as a region. But within this framework, important perspective to this is a membership to the European Union, which has proved to have transformation, transformational power in the neighborhood policy, in the building democratic societies and responsible governments. That would definitely, and is showing, help uh, to prevent the conflict, along with collective security power of NATO, will help to uh, also contribute or aid with our knowledge to conflict management in some other parts of the world, and to uh, help uh, implement the post-conflict models in some other parts of the world. I uh, was deployed in Sierra Leone in 2007, in South Sudan in 2010, and uh, my knowledge, my experience has shown to be uh, of value added to the leadership there, but also what I learned is that those countries went through reconciliation faster than the Balkan region. Implementing policy that addresses the root causes of atrocity crimes can also aid in overcoming periods of instability and promoting peace. This may include taking steps to mitigate tensions within the state, removing the main sources of grievances, stopping crimes, that are already taking place and promoting justice and accountability for crimes and violence. As the Secretary General noted in his recent report on the responsibility to protect, there is no one size fits all approach to atrocity prevention. Different states and regions will need to address the underlying risk factors that have the potential to lead to atrocities in the manner best suited to their circumstances. While states bear the primary responsibility for protecting their population from mass atrocities, the international community can play an important role in helping to promote global peace and stability. Collaboration and cooperation with, within, with international actors can greatly contribute in preventing and helping halting genocide and mass atrocities in a variety of ways. Within the European Union, the Visegrad Group and the Western Balkans, Balkans, various steps have been taken in order to strengthen capacities within individual states and to encourage the responsibility to protect. States such as France, Germany, Norway, Denmark and the UK have either codified the responsibility to protect or vocally expressed their support of R2P at the national level. The progress made within these states sets an example for countries who have not yet taken action on this issue to embrace RTP at the national level. Within Montenegro, my government is firmly committed to promoting the 
responsibility to protect. In 2013, we named the National R2P Focal Point, who is responsible for uh, domestically promoting R2P and supporting international cooperation within a global network of involved actors. Our neighbors, Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, have also nominated National R2P Focal Points. The National R2P Focal Points and res uh, representatives of these states recently participated in the regional meeting of National Focal Points in Ljubljana, and we have heard during the first panel that uh, it was very impressive and very important. What is needed now is some kind of national mechanism as strengthening the existing international standards related to the implementation of R2P, strengthening the overall national infrastructure for the protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms needs additional instruments and actions. To this end, I see the importance <coughs> of exercising the active participation and membership in the UN Human Rights Council and its mechanism, particularly uh, the UN, the various of periodic review, and special procedures, as well as mainstreaming the support of the international community to the overall implementation of the universal human rights principles, and I want to recognize Hungarian leadership on this within the Human Rights Council. Beyond the greater emphasis on prevention, it is important to continue working towards reconciliation for past atrocities. Along with the other states in the Western Balkans, Montenegro is dedicated to promoting dialogue and reconciliation within the entire region and working towards greater cooperation as well as integration with the European Union. And again, framework and perspective of European Union is crucial for the Balkan. In line with this, Montenegro has fully cooperated with the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and the International Commission on Missing Persons. We also signed the International Convention for Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance and ratified it in 2011. There has been a continued channel of close communication with some challenges and cooperation with the working group on investigations carried out with regard to the case known as deportation of 193 Muslims from Montenegro to Bosnia and Herzegovina. As noted in the report of the chairman congratulating the government of Montenegro for its decision to accept the responsibility and provide rep reparation for victims and its families, and I quote, Montenegro sets a positive example that should be followed by other countries to confirm the strong commitment to international human rights standards, truth and justice. And unquote. Reconciliation must stay an important part of moving forward and bringing justice to those responsible for mass atrocities in the Balkans can greatly contribute to strengthening peace and stability. Many historic apologies came too late but even then, they were welcome. The tragic events of Srebrenica, where more than 8,000 men and boys were killed, remains a stark reminder to the region that atrocities from the recent past are still impacting events today. Some of those responsible are still at large, and many victims' remains have not yet been identified. That's why it is important that when we look towards future steps for the promotion of R2P, we include a focus on issues of prevention, human rights and reconciliation, and we do not lose sight of the need for renewed and continued international cooperation. And I thank you. Thank you very much. It's interesting to see the perspective of uh, Montenegro through focus of a series of procedures. You see how much you uh, give a positive assessment to the Human Rights Council, to UPR as a relatively new device, mechanism, the whole system to overcome firstly what was in the past uh, during the work of the former UN Commission on Human Rights and how this impacts on your country. 
and uh, we will keep in mind for probably further discussion and questions uh, your points. Although this uh, well known statement that uh, there is no one size uh, fits all in the solution, uh, but you tell this to us from your experience so that it works that a number of possible arrangements are very well determined by your own problem. You said structural problems must be first identified uh, because probably our discussion on how to prevent conflict should start from what, uh, what is the problem? What are the problems? And then uh, just to seek for remedies. Let's go then to uh, our speaker. I will now give the floor to Drino Galicic. Drino is a PhD candidate of the Joint Program in Diversity <coughs> and and Governance of the University of Graz in Austria. But importantly, Drino has already looked at the 15 years of uh, experience as legal advisor on constitutional, judicial, and legal reform in Southeast and Central Europe, within major international organizations like the Council of Europe, OSC, and a lot of others. And currently, he is a staff member of the European Union delegation, EU Special Representative in Bosnia Herzegovina, in charge of judicial reference and ICTY cooperation. So you see how you will give us probably interesting remarks. You have the floor. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the organizer for inviting me to such a prestigious event. Um, in particular, thank you for being able to uh, enter this building again after 97 when I was uh, almost uh, at the end of my studies in, in France, I came here for the first time under the then uh, COLPI Initiative, Constitutional and Legal Policy Institute, uh, bringing together all the young lawyers from the four Yugoslav countries to exchange experience right after the end of the uh, war, how to bring new reforms, how to bring new ways and impetus to the region. So thank you very much for this opportunity and I will be uh, focusing today on my personal experiences uh, in the work of last uh, couple of uh, years in judicial reform, in particularly how to bring and how to form uh, the capacities of uh, local uh, judicial communities to face uh, with the difficult task of uh, trying the war crimes and trying uh, all these difficult cases uh, in the local courts but uh, more in particular how to uh, prepare uh, another part uh, in society beyond the war crimes is uh, what is called dealing with the past in general and what was colloquially has been used under the term transitional justice. We had since the very beginning the problem of the concept of transitional justice since it was not uh, really understood since the very beginning by our societies as something new and in particular, um, when after the war everyone expected uh, very quickly the cases to be solved uh, in the courts. Uh, with many, many expectations, of course, uh, being uh, given to the ICTY first, but also when the local courts were enabled progressively to deal with these cases, of course, the expectations were also at the local level. However, um, to start with, there is a general um, there is a general assumption, uh, and in this regard, I will also refer to my research so far as uh, our distinguished chairman mentioned. I'm in the almost final phase of my doctoral studies in Graz, and the, it, it, this is the assumption under which, the, in, in general, apart from the criminal justice response as one of the parts of the transition of justice, all other aspects have been widely disregarded. In, uh, not only in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but in, in the other countries of the region, in Serbia, in Croatia, and so on. So, uh, why is it so? Why 
the scholarly literature, but also some critics, uh, sometimes justify saying that no serious attempts has been made in dealing with the past, or that the reconciliation in large sense didn't produce any significant results. I would try to explain a little bit that this picture is not always black and white, and uh, beyond, as I said, the efforts to, uh, that were lodged with the uh, tribunals, uh, be it international or local, there are some efforts in the very difficult context of the last decade uh, that were done, but of course the fruits of these efforts are still maybe uh, pending and are still yet to come. In particular, we have to remind that, uh, for instance, in this uh, region, after the launching of the stabilization and association process in 2001, which is the broader framework for the Western Balkans to join the European Union, uh, some actions and some first steps towards uh, uh, trying of the war crimes and, and later on reconciliation could be only possible after certain major political changes have been uh, done. In particular, I would remain, uh, I would refer to the surrender of the of some political personalities to the International uh, Criminal Tribunal. I would speak mainly of Slobodan Milosevic and other who ended up in, in the Hague. However, uh, the picture is always uh, mitigated also in the sense that uh, ICTY, although uh, had, having very important role and these uh, judgments in the beginning at least, uh, having very important impact in the societies themselves, didn't really manage to produce uh, uh, another uh, let's say, uh, another element of the reconciliation as such, which is this broader uh, uh, readiness of these societies to deal with the past, which is the consequence or, let's say, the impact of, of those judgments. Uh, therefore, the European Union has used uh, very often the conditionality, particularly towards Serbia and Croatia, uh, much less than to, towards Bosnia, to actually arrest and extradite the main culprits for uh, war crimes. And I wouldn't here distinguish only uh, the genocide, and I would not, uh, let's say, single out the genocide here, but also all other types of war crimes against humanity, against civilians, and so on. And later on, I will also, in my kind of modest recommendations for further action, I will also try to put symbolically the place on under this auspices, this conference organized under the auspices of the Michigan group, but we always also have a a very symbolic place Visegrad in Bosnia and Herzegovina and the border between Serbia and, and Bosnia, which made famous of the famous bridge there, but there were mass atrocities were committed there on the very bridge. So thousands and thousands of people killed and drove out in the, in the river without many of them of the perpetrators being brought to justice. So here there is something uh, also to be uh, to considered as a, uh, how to deal with the consequences, how to deal with the, uh, these next steps or with the, with the second phase of the uh, justice efforts in, in, in the region. And, and this is the whole, uh, I would say, open question today. Um, of course, uh, we could not always draw from some experiences abroad or this comparative perspective is not always easy, particularly not with the Germany or South Africa, because Sometimes in these countries, a lot of course time work was necessary to admit certain things. But here we live in a context in which not only sovereignty paradigm and sovereignty paradox of these countries is still very present, because we speak not only with Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also maybe with Kosovo and maybe Macedonia, uh, as, as, as sometimes literature also points out, with unfinished states or let's say failed states. This is the, the terminology that we can often find in this scholarly literature. So the sovereignty is something also very important to, to have in mind, is that these countries are from within, sometimes also from the outside, but less and less, uh, hopefully, but from within, in, in essentially are contested. In such a context of contested states, and where the groups who are contesting these states are also, not only, of course, but are also one of the, uh, let's say, uh, from there some uh, conflicts from the uh, uh, mass atrocities are coming. 
this is very difficult to organize a debate, yet alone the battle, as we spoke this morning, between all the parts of the society. Uh, and this is why I really was uh, pleased to, to hear that some results could be brought towards to uh, some small steps and some small battles as the Nazi is doing uh, all, all this time. I myself are participate, I participate right now in a very, let's say, ambitious exercise called Structure Dialogue for Justice, which also is meant to reopen or basically making to, to uh, listen to all those, uh, let's say, controversial points of the organization of the judiciary in the country, who is supposed to be strong and independent, but also contested from within, because, as I said, the sovereignty paradigm is there, and the sovereignty and the statehood itself is contested. So if this is contested, of course, we contest also the fact that the state must have institutions to deal with these issues. So, in this context, it's not always easy to apprehend the questions like dealing with the past, uh, war crimes uh, cases, and so on and so forth. So, how to, how to deal with these issues and how to go beyond the criminal justice response? Uh, we, within the uh, EU mission there, uh, were trying, of course, with the other international organization, primarily uh, with the UN, who led actually the process of creating or preparing the so-called transition justice strategy for the country, uh, which is existing in the form of a draft and which is still pending the adoption by the central government and then the parliament. But these organizations are very much uh, present in trying to put some pillars, in trying to put some uh, uh, possibilities for the larger public, for NGOs, for society, for victims, groups, associations, and so on, to participate in discovery and in a dialogue, and to try to uh, bring some concrete results as much as possible, of course. Uh, the expectations of, were high in the beginning uh, because of the only presence of international community, because of the huge funds that were given to some institutions in the, in the very beginning. So, uh, legitimately, it was expected that due to all these uh, assistance, especially financial assistance, result, results will come. However, we all know that these uh, issues like transitional justice and particularly reconciliation, reparations, civil reparations, truth telling, and so on are very, very long term and it cannot be uh, passed overnight. So, uh, how to support actually, how to give some concrete elements of answer to what's next? First of all, uh, not only the EU but other organizations are primarily through the UN structures, uh, there is a need to, to, to support and still to facilitate the work of the set of the authorities to all the pass the strategy and to work them towards their implementation. Uh, somebody will tell, yes, but implementation is very complex because it involves all sorts of institutions and in a country with uh, more than uh, uh, 14 governments in, in, in one single place, it's very difficult to envisage the uh, effective implementation of, 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 of such a doctrine. However, <coughs> what I'm asking also, not only myself, but all, all the others, what's the alternative? What's the alternative then to start to continue supporting at least uh, piece by piece, step by step, these small issues and initiatives that could eventually one day bring to uh, some larger forum and some larger concrete results? Uh, so, first is to, for, for the country, of course, is to have this comprehensive strategy as drafted, then to prepare to pass on the concrete action plan. And somebody has mentioned this morning some action plan here to see for that also. It was very important that, at one way or another, we were interested in and this would be my suggestion to all those who are working in this very commendable initiative by the Budapest Center. When creating these, um, let's say, uh, programs and when trying to promote the common strategy for the region, it's also very important that have in mind the, the combination of the existing similar documents and, for instance, to find the places where that we can see the compatibility between the strategies that exist on the spot and that would be eventually combined with those strategies or action plans that are needed for every country. So I guess that one day when we have all these RTP contact points and so on, that they 
also uh, become as an as instigator or at as, as, as somebody who will push forward the, the adoption and then implementation of the provision just strategy because it's not needed. Uh, second, I would uh, suggest also that, and, and I would rely on the presentation this morning when the EU was um, mentioning uh, I mean, various institutions being the delegation of the EAS, uh, what to do and what they could do eventually. But first of all, is to reflect all these topics that we speak about today in the proper mandates of these organizations, at least on the, uh, of, of the personalities that are in charge. Today, the mandate of the EU Special Representative has very broad rule of law mandate, but without specifically speaking about these issues of transitional justice or reconciliation as such. So we have, because in, in, intentionally this was left maybe to UN or to other organizations in the field, but there is more and more demand that actually to the process that was, or in one time, used as EU conditionality, meaning the arrest and extradition of the fugitives to pay continues that in the second phase there is also a presence because of course the consequences as I said in the beginning are very much important. Uh, somebody will say today of course post Srebrenica I mean these issues of prevention uh, is about not uh, letting things to happen but I would say and experiences uh, demonstrating in this very moment that uh, it is also uh, to prevent things to continue. Because many people will tell you today that the genocide is continuing by other means. And particularly, I would mention the uh, concrete problem of uh, this focus only about basic human rights and problems in education and so on. At this very moment, a groups of people from who are living in Srebrenica, basically the returnees of uh, Bosnian nationality to Srebrenica are facing the problem of, uh, the, uh, of their children who were uh, unable or were prevented to, to go to local schools and to have classes in not only the language uh, which is called by their name but also to not to have actually the history books in which the actions like those happening in Srebrenica are glorified or eventually the perpetrators are making heroes. So all these things are very important in the peaceful times. And to conclude, I have just uh, quote one of my uh, directors of, of research in the University of Graz is that we are living here in a negative peace. So what to do to transform the negative peace into the positive peace is, I think, our common a lot of uh, interesting ideas you have uh, informed us about. We have a bit of questions. I uh, believe that, as you generally say, that if there are questions where all states are uh, the Baltic, uh, the Balkan region failed or unfinished. It shows that the whole task is an unfinished business what we are doing. So we should be aware of that. that we are still very far from uh, um, achievement of certain basic uh, starting points. But I will come back to this uh, on, uh, on uh, at the end of uh, this panel. Let me now. Um, Let me now introduce Francesco de Santis, a qualified lawyer, with 10 years of professional experience, including about academic experience in the areas of justice, human rights, and the rule of law. He worked for five years in expert position in the OSC in Bosnia Herzegovina with EU rule of law mission in Kosovo and in some similar other positions. He is currently assistant professor at the Sarajevo School of Science and Technology and works as consultant on rule of law issues for governmental and intergovernmental organizations. So you have the floor. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to 
it's possible to have access to the computer. Anyway, I don't need to change the pages because it's just one page. It's okay. This is when lawyers work for science and technology schools. Yeah, it's <laughs> Uh, my fish will uh, deal with the uh, punishment for uh, convicted war criminals. As my colleague Nino was, uh, let's say, mentioning, justice, of course, is not the only, criminal justice is not the only, let's say, component of a transitional justice strategy. However, it is still an important one and can really affect the perception from the different groups about what has happened during the conflict. As a matter of fact, probably the ICTY trials in The Hague are our main source of, uh, um, it's our main record to basically describe what has happened in different locations in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Criminal justice is also important in terms of uh, uh, deterrence. And here maybe comes the link also with the uh, FTP. Um, Deterrence is uh, linked with the function and uh, the uh, aims of punishment. Basically, what kind of punishment are we going to impose on those who committed crimes such as genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes? That's a very interesting and difficult question. Um, there has been different opinions in this regard. Uh, there are some, let's say, uh, voices saying that you know, very harsh sentences should be imposed, of course, short of the penalty, not that we would anymore in Europe. But let's say that long term imprisonment or life imprisonment should be, let's say, the other sentence in case of uh, multiple or mass crimes. Uh, there are other, of course, voices. Uh, putting more stress on uh, uh, rehabilitation, so for, you know, not putting the stress on how many years. I would just say, in this regard, that uh, I think that the sentencing policy for this kind of crimes should be consistent with the sentencing policy for crimes of the time of peace. We can't allow to have uh, inconsistency between these two policies, because in case, for example, that we have a more serious sentence for crimes committed in time of peace, there can be the legitimate uh, conclusion that uh, war crimes are uh, a B class uh, crimes. They are less serious because they are meted with, uh, let's say, more even punishment. Now, uh, my presentation tries to structure to this point and to outline a current problem that has emerged in Bosnia and Herzegovina with regard to sentencing policy. The, uh, I don't know if you heard about the existence of the war crimes chamber in Bosnia and Herzegovina. This has been a court established in Sarajevo with the uh, purpose of trying war crimes and it has, uh, let's say, been uh, uh, built under a strict cooperation with the ICTY. <coughs> now, this court is the only court in the region, and also in Bosnia and Herzegovina, who has been imposing for serious crimes, such for example, also genocide in uh, Srebrenica, but also other crimes, for example, those committed in Visegrad and in Prior, sentences up to 40 45 years. Other courts in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also in Serbia, in Montenegro, in Croatia, uh, when trying their war crimes cases, they have not been, in, they didn't impose sentences uh, for a number of years superior to 20. Now, what is the reason for such difference in sentencing policy? Uh, it's not about political will, at least, let's say, not uh, manifest. It's about application of different codes, a different legal framework. Uh, these courts in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, the other courts different from the War Crimes Chamber and the courts in the uh, other courts in the region, have been applying the code that was applicable at the time of the conflict. 
namely the uh, code, the criminal code of the uh, federal, uh, socialist federal republic of Yugoslavia. This whole graph, I, I think I will uh, see it because otherwise I'm going to have to follow me with the camera. It's, uh, and uh, the, under this code, the penalty for war crimes and genocide was from a minimum of one year to a maximum of 15 years in prison, or for the most serious cases, that penalty. The penalty could be commuted to 20 years. So you understand that since the penalty is not anymore applicable, by applying the code that was applicable at the time of the conflict, the maximum sentence can be 15 or 20 years. That's the maximum. Uh, the worker chamber took a different approach. They basically have been applying a code that has been passed after, well after the events, namely in 2003, the BIH criminal code, the first criminal code at the state level. This code uh, not, uh, remarkable differences from the uh, previous S5-1, not only because it includes also crimes against humanity, which was a category of crime not foreseen under the uh, Yugoslavian code, but also because it rearranges, of course, the uh, sentencing policy. It has, uh, let's say, for the specific uh, war crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, a minimum of five years up to a maximum of 45 years. The same sentence that is applicable, for example, in Bosnia and Herzegovina for other civil crimes, such as, for example, like murder in Israel. So let's say that clearly Bosnia and Herzegovina, different from, example, from other countries like Norway, has, um, let's say, decided freely to adopt a sentencing policy that can arrive to impose a sentence up to 45 years. And there is a very good company in Europe. Say. Regardless of what we think about what you meant of uh, adding uh, more lenient or more action punishment, the reality is that the work uh, uh, the work uh, in Sarajevo has been able to uh, let's say import this kind of sentences, <coughs> which basically are consistent with the sentences that will be applied for uh, serious crimes in this time. Now, uh, the application of the new code by the work and chamber has been a source of uh, very high controls, as Vino very well knows. Because at the, among the, uh, let's say, um, judges or the legal professional community, it has been criticized as a violation of the, uh, let's say, prohibition to retroactively apply criminal law. This, we know, is one of the basic pillars of criminal law. I don't need to, do, to speak more about that. And uh, so basically this has been uh, uh, matched with a lot of criticism, this, let's say, application, retroactive application. Of course, the work and chamber has been putting forward some arguments to justify this approach. Among other, for example, is that the uh, code uh, basically is more lenient than the previous one because it doesn't foresee that penalty that was applicable at the time of the conflict. Um, but nevertheless, this has been a point of discussion to the extent of becoming a point of political discussion. As Rino knows, one of the reasons, or one of the main topics in the structured dialogue that he was mentioning is also this, let's say, contested application of the courts. Now, in this, let's say, very already complex discussion, the uh, human rights, uh, the European Court of Human Rights, came out very recently in July with a decision in the Maktouf Damianovich case in which basically held that the, uh, at least from a certain aspect, the sentence imposed, the retroactive application of the code by the World Crime Chamber is in violation of uh, Article 7. Article 7, for those that are not totally familiar, is exactly the article which protects the principle of legality the principle of legality in the definition of crimes and also of sentences. Uh, what basically um, the European Court briefly said, said that with regard to minimum sentences, because Maktouf and Damianic were sentenced under uh, the first one to five years and the second one to eleven, these sentences, they fall into the range or lower range sentences. In such case, the court said the applicable code must be the S5 code. 
because it is indeed more linear. Clearly, we say here the minimum is 5, here the minimum is 1. So they say basically, if the S flat code was applied, there was the real possibility that they would have got a more lenient sentence. This is a very sound conclusion. Uh, it's difficult to challenge that. And actually, the work chamber has been very quick in, uh, impl uh, in implementing this decision. Uh, what the decision of Strasbourg doesn't say is what happens with sentences that are belonging to the higher range. In such case, which one is the more linear code? The S prime one, with the death penalty that is not anymore applicable, or the BH criminal code one? Criminal, yeah, the 2003 one. Uh, the European Court doesn't take a position in this regard. However, this is a very, let's say, complex and serious issue. Because if we find that the uh, work crime chamber has been violating the European Convention for every sentence that is below 15 years, we are talking about uh, dozens and dozens of judgments that have to be posted. Uh, this case had to be retried and possibly to impose sentences for, in case of even of, uh, let's say, the murder of hundreds of people, sentences within the 15 years range. Of course, this is a very serious concern because, I mean, how are you going to explain to the witnesses that they have to come to testify again because the sentence that was uh, held for years to be legitimate has been washed on the basis of this very, very complicated you know, uh, legal argument, which sometimes even I don't understand, really. I, mean, I, I get confused when I talk about this thing myself. Imagine when you have to explain it to someone that doesn't have a legal background. I, I would like to have that kind of uh, uh, text. Now, um, as I said, the Strasbourg Court uh, doesn't address this, uh, let's say, very uh, sensitive issue. However, this situation, let's say, the legality of sentences uh, for more than 15 years, has been instead addressed by the Constitutional Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina just a few weeks ago. The Constitutional Court has found uh, in the decision has actually quashed. Uh, 10, I think 10 or 11 uh, judgments from the work crime chamber, including also some sentences related to genocide, with sentences of uh, between 30 and 40 years. So clearly, the Constitutional Court has taken a stance, has decided to apply the uh, Strasbourg precedent in a very extensive way. Now, we may speculate about the reasons about that. It's possible to say that this is a very cautious approach in order to avoid further damage, we may say. Um, another, let's say, uh, possibility is that uh, they want to take approach to that so-called expression of favore. On the other hand, uh, they, it's fair to say because the judgment, the written judgment of the Constitutional Court is still not out yet, um, I, it would be interesting to see whether they paid attention to the uh, problem in implementing this president in such an extensive way when it comes to, let's say, fairness in uh, sentencing policy. We already mentioned the problem that now we are going to have so clearly a disparity between I can, let's say, get sentenced to 40 years if I kill someone now, but I mean I will get no more than 50 years if I've been killing hundreds of people in a uh, uh, war time. Uh, not to mention that uh, if your maximum sentence is 15 years, you have to respect some proportionality, which means, and we have the evidence of that already from the uh, trials at the entity level, that for torture cases, you may get the punishment of two or three years. Because I mean, there must be have a proportion, of course. If I give 15 years for multiple murder, I mean, it's not only natural that I do two, three years of torture. Uh, natural, however, I mean, I think we are talking about a serious problem with the deterrent function of the sentence here. I, I'm wondering what is the deterrence value of this kind of uh, sentencing policy. To uh, conclude, and not to mention about other problems uh, in regard to 
say, uh, compatibility or punishment. And we also have to consider that the jurisprudence of the Strasbourg Court has been uh, very quickly changing in these years, but dramatically. From a consideration of a, uh, paragraph 2 of Article 7 as being an exception to the paragraph 1 to actually being the total redundant. Dramatically, right? I mean, from uh, let's say one call to the office. In such context, maybe it would have been uh, um, advisable or preferable for the European Court to give more guidance to the Bosnian institution and also basically to consider these opposing interests to consider that we have to reconcile different values. The, of course, sacred principle of legality, that we know that is, let's say, a pillar of criminal justice, but on the other hand, also fairness in sentencing, let's say, logic in sentencing. I mean, to avoid that basically we are missing totally the one of the main functions of criminal justice, which is uh, deterrence, but also let's say, retribution or promotion. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Francesco. Uh, we needed also that perhaps strictly legal aspect concerning conviction of uh, perpetrators. And that we are in this difficult situation of a number of jurisdictions changing criminal codes in the countries. Uh, and I think that this is a very difficult lesson for not only Bosnia Herzegovina, this is also for other countries in the region. Uh, let us not forget, let me tell you just an example, that well-established democracies with independent and uh, uh, impartial judiciary like England and France once in the 1970s showed a very good case, I found it in research on comparative law, there was a couple, mixed couple, he was French, she was English, and they after a few years decided to divorce. But the hot atmosphere between them made him to learn his in the French court when she left for London and uh, not just came before the English court. Imagine that French court found her guilty of the divorce uh, reasons for the description characteristics and contrary was in, um, in the other country. So sometimes impartiality means your close understanding of your national uh, before the court. Therefore, in, uh, including those uh, legal difficulties, that's, that's been, this is a big challenge. And yet one element, Francesco, you said that uh, um, Council of Europe, the court, took broader approach as well as Constitutional Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina, perhaps this is what we know, a part of pressure um, exerted on Bosnia and Herzegovina by both the Council of Europe system of supervision of judgments, Article 41, the Committee of Ministers regularly asking uh, questions concerning, uh, concerning uh, implementation, and also um, uh, impact of Brussels, which needs this, uh, these judgments to be to be implemented. Let us not forget that uh, we have a judgment on Sadie and Finn Chief uh, <laughs> long time ago, five years already would be so, and still this is a, on the agenda of Council of Europe Committee of Ministers discussing execution of judgments. This is important political system element, the question of electoral list for Roma and the Jewish minority within this complicated system of power sharing by different ethnic communities. Anyway, judgment must be executed. And the same is probably sh uh, showing the light how these cases will have to be uh, dealt with in, in those countries. Thank you very much again. Now, I would like to give the floor to Julieta Goranci, uh, who is a general manager at the Nansen Dialogue Center in Sarajevo, in Herzegovina. Uh, she has been working in Nansen Dialogue Center in Sarajevo for some time. And uh, you should know that she's also by education a medical doctor. So I will ask you how do you see this perception when you try 
to assess symptoms before coming to a conclusion on diagnosis. You have the floor. Yeah. Thank you, organizers, for inviting me uh, to take part in this important event. I will try uh, to give you a short overview of our work. Uh, of our work in Bosnia and Herzegovina, as uh, someone who is working in the Central Center of Sarajevo. Uh, thank you. You already explained the, the methodology of our work. So I will just give you a short introduction of the political of history of Nelson Dalton Center. So we are local citizens association. What is really important uh, when it comes to the Bosnia and Herzegovina, it is that we are multi-ethnic structure, uh, that we are having a multi-ethnic structure of the staff. And NDC Sarajevo has, uh, was established in uh, 2000. Nansen Dialogue uh, Center is uh, Sarajevo is member of Nansen Dialogue Network, uh, with, and we have set 11 centers in all over of one So, uh, you already explained the uh, really difficult situation and complicated situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and according to the agreement, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina is um, combined by two entities, the creation of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and the uh, Republic of Serbska. Uh, majority in Federation of Bosnia and uh, Croat, and who would have been the Republic of Serbska, Serbian population. So there is two offices of high representative in Bosnia. I have to say that this is a beautiful country, but with very, with very complicated uh, political situation and uh, not functional society. Um, as, uh, I already mentioned that uh, this is a divided society, and ethnicity in Bosnia and Herzegovina is a key for all issues, the social, political, economic, and uh, war trauma is uh, still very much present. So, Nelson uh, Dialogue Center Sarajevo, I already mentioned, will be opened the center 2000, the first of the uh, of 2000, and uh, I'm working and I'm engaged uh, there uh, since the very beginning of the, um, of the opening of the center. So, uh, from 2000 to 2005, uh, we were uh, focused on uh, inter ethnic uh, dialogue work with municipal representatives. NGO activists, journalists, primary and secondary school teachers, university students, and professors. To be about present uh, that time uh, in Sarajevo and also in um, the region of Eastern Bosnia and Western Bosnia as well. But uh, 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 from 2006, we decided to get focused on the region of Serbia and Sankratuna. Uh, we have been asked uh, from different people why we um, got focused on the most complicated area of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And we said if we succeed uh, in uh, such a uh, hard, uh, such a uh, heavy, complicated area, uh, we can make it anywhere. So. Um, one of the reasons, uh, besides that reason why we decided to choose Reverend and Bratunas, it was because uh, there, were significant, there was a significant number of returnees. Uh, so, uh, population uh, practi uh, practically operates in severe survival mode, and uh, there are still, even still many say the war was better. So, um, it's, uh, after, after these three years of implementation of, um, of uh, our inter-ethnic dialogue uh, work, we moved from uh, Severance and Bratunac to Yaitse and Zvalnik. Yaitse is located in central Bosnia, inhabited by a majority of Croatian and Bosnian population. And what is... Um, 
special for uh, this city is that everybody was in a certain time during the war a refugee. Uh, Zvornik is located in uh, southeastern Bosnia and the majority of population uh, are, uh, is Serbian population and also Bosnia, uh, Bosnia returnees. 2010, we uh, got focus as we included in uh, our work creator, located in uh, Western Bosnia, and then Sanski most as well. They are neighboring uh, municipalities, uh, but located one in Republika Srpska, one in uh, Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. As a national dialogue center, Sarajevo, we have two area offices, one in Srebrenica and one in, uh, in the Prijeda. Um, the, what is uh, important to uh, to mention it is that um, that we have two project line. One is municipality returnees dialogue, and the result the results that we have achieved uh, it is that um, we have uh, established informal uh, informal. Um, if I can, uh, informal organization is not proper uh, word, but uh, 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 national coordination boards consisted by members of those national coordination boards are people from uh, that municipalities, uh, and what is really important that they are multi-ethnic and uh, that they cooperate together and that they uh, create and implement projects by themselves uh, with our support. I just would like also to mention that as a national dialogue center, uh, we don't implement projects. Uh, we, uh, we are we are running the process, and uh, I didn't know how to say. Do I? Uh, is it proper work to say oh, we are leading the process? No, we don't lead. We do it together with the, all our partners, with citizens from those municipalities. And also, I thought, okay, should I say well, we are facilitating? No, we don't facilitate because we are actively involved. So, if I can say well, we are running the process. And uh, why I don't like to say uh, we are implementing project because it is not a project. Uh, re uh, reconciliation is not a project. It is the process. And uh, uh, and um, reconciliation is, if I can say, it is longer term goal because uh, we cannot achieve that goal over the night. And. Um, to deconstruct human relationship, it's not easy, and it's even not attractive to the donors because you cannot see immediate results. This and that's why it is the process. But uh, I have to mention uh, also that Norwegian government uh, has been really patient to see the first results of our work. And we are supported uh, fully by the Norwegian government in our work. So this is municip municipal returnees dialogue result as a national coordination board so that we have people who are so skeptic when we arrive to their municipalities. When we arrive, we said, no, we didn't come to reconstruct anything, we didn't bring money to you. We just came to help you, to facilitate your discussion, dialogue. And they were looking at us. What you are talking about? I mean, because I mean, uh, uh, as uh, work has been finished, but with real present uh, 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 consequences. And uh, as uh, my colleagues mentioned today, there are uh, there are still. Uh, that, uh, if we are talking more about Srebrenica, there are around uh, eight thousand victims. The, uh, the same case is in Prijedor municipality also. Prijedor has been uh, very much affected by the war. And uh, so we went there and we helped to the people. I have to say that we had obstacles at the very beginning and resistance from the people. Obstacles were coming mainly from the local politicians, but those who uh, 
who created the obstacles now, if I can say, they are uh, we are at the same side, we are doing the same things, we are uh, we are building uh, the function of society, uh, society where everybody will have the same opportunities and the same rights. Uh, so. Uh, okay, so they are, uh, I mean, members uh, of uh, Nansen uh, Coordination Board from Svetlitz and Bratuna. 21 people, we try to have gender balance, but um, I have to say there are more women than men. Although we try to, to be. <laughs> so, uh, the if uh, the second uh, project line is school, um, I will I will just give you a short overview uh, about the uh, project line. Yeah. Schools for all. This is about school in the Republic of Srpska, uh, 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 located in Bratunac, and there is a central school in uh, Kranz. I know that I, I know that those names are not known to you, but uh, Kranz is. Uh, Village inhabited by mainly Serbian population, and Konjac Polje is inhabited mainly by Bosnian population. And both villages have significant, uh, significant importance for both ethnic groups. So uh, before the war started, uh, parents of those kids uh, uh, attended uh, this school. Central and area school, but uh, they attended attended the uh, buildings according to the um, territorial belongings. Now children are uh, attending schools according to ethnic background. So that means that uh, Serbs Serbs are attending only Kravica and Bosnian kids uh, Konjac Uh What is um, also, uh, somehow for Bosnian and Herzegovian uh, circumstances, uh, um, strange for this, uh, this as a problem in education, it is that uh, this school has the same school administration. So, but without interaction uh, between the children. What we decided what to do, because we cannot, uh, we cannot um, change uh, we cannot unify school in an administrative way because uh, it is uh, it, 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 it is it uh, it depends to the political uh, leaders. I mean, it is a political issue. So we want to uh, to help to the kids uh, uh, to interact, to have a space for dialogue, and uh, to uh, to ask each other questions, not to create image about each other. <coughs> And uh, then we decided to ask parents uh, to reconstruct two classrooms, but uh, all together, so Bastiaks and Serbs together in Konjac, Kvala and Kravica. They did it for the English uh, classroom in uh, Kravica and uh, IT in Konjac, uh, Of course, because those two subjects are the most attractive to the parents. And uh, now, uh, and what we achieved is that children uh, at, uh, are attending uh, extra curricular uh, classes in uh, both schools, but multi-ethnic. So this is about this school, and uh, this is uh, the first interaction that parents had together after the war, and it uh, took place 2007. So. Yes, uh, it is 12 years after the work has been finished. Um, use dial uh, I have also to, to mention that we are working in uh, secondary schools in all municipalities, in all six municipalities where we work. And as a result of this work, is uh, our target groups are teachers, uh, parents, and uh, of course students. And with students, it is really a pleasure to work, but parents are, uh, well, they make obstacles, if I can say. I mean, it is really hard to work with them. But um, what is important that uh, to us, uh, it is important that students, that they are working together. And nevertheless, what they are doing, nevertheless, 
how many of them from each ethnic group will we have. And um, so, uh, as a result of that, we have Nansen, uh, youth, uh, for, uh, Nansen Forum of Youth Peace Builders in all schools that we work with. And uh, we have in Srebrenica, we established a Nansen multi ethnic section of uh, young journalists in uh, Zvornik uh, photographs, and uh, in Yaitsa, we have young uh, multi ethnic, Nansen multi ethnic volleyball uh, team, and uh, we have even culinary uh, section, and they cook together. And, uh, Sometimes uh, those kids, uh, they play guitar together. Uh, they are reading poetry in school because in each school they have Nansen classrooms and they read poetry from all over former Yugoslavia, from writers from all over uh, former Yugoslavia. And then uh, when uh, watchman, uh, watchman comes to close the school, um, they just uh, move to the bar and uh, they play guitar and they are together. Before that, when we came there, they were going out in their, in their own uh, bars. I mean, their own mono-ethnic bars. And what is, uh, what I see as a problem, uh, we had integrated education when I was a student. And now, uh, and I remember that time, and I remember how it looked like. But now, nowadays generations, they don't remember, and they don't see this as a problem. And that's why I'm so much struggling for that, because after my generations, uh, my children will not remember. I mean, they will, because I'm teaching them, and they are going to the multi school in Sarajevo. But I mean, uh, majority of, of kids, they will not, and even now, they don't see this as a problem. And uh, I know, and I, uh, okay, okay. So, um, you, uh, and for the children, I mean, uh, I am a practitioner, and the uh, Nancy Dialogue Center is very much uh, focused on uh, activity. But we have uh, also component of research, and we already conducted two, um, if I can say, rounds of research, uh, together with Safe a World from London. And uh, one of the findings that we did with youth, they said, we don't have a problem to be together, we actually want to be together. But uh, we don't remember the war because some of us we were not born uh, during the war. Or to us who were born, we don't remember. But who is poisoning us? Those are our parents, <coughs> our teachers. As you mentioned, the, the one uh, young woman from Banja Luka, she said, I'm a student of economy, and when I listen to uh, my teacher who is uh, teaching me economy, and when he's uh, talking about his work here, I cannot tell him that he's not there to listen that, that I'm there because of economy. I, so, I mean, uh, youth, they are ready for dialogue, and they want to be together. So that's uh, why our role is really important to help them. Because if we don't do that, uh, then we will have in 15 or some, in some a certain period of time, uh, three mono-ethnic uh, societies within one country without, I mean, yeah, with some uh, minorities. So, uh, I can't talk, I mean, you see. <laughs> so, but what I would like also to mention that um, we, uh, as I said, we don't implement projects, and that makes Nansen Dialogue Center different than others. Because in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we had uh, brilliant projects, but unfortunately, they were just projects started and finished without follow up. So we exist, but I accepted to implement a pro pilot project, uh, and. Uh, there are some uh, mistakes, so, so uh, I'm sorry, it's bad mistakes. So, uh, this is about prostitution. 
as um, my colleague from uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina mentioned, uh, our constitution uh, and our constitution recognizes only three ethnic groups, and you mentioned the Lichpinski case and etc. So what we decide, we decide with the 16, 17 years old students about constitution. Why? Uh, the purpose is uh, to raise up the awareness about uh, their citizens' role, to think about what they want to change or not, what is good in their constitution, what they should improve. So, uh, at the moment, uh, we are implementing the second phases and uh, we are present in 36 schools in Bosnia and Herzegovina, 16 in Republika Srpska, uh, 16 in the uh, Federation and 4 in Turchko district. And uh, the first phases of this project has been supported by American uh, Embassy and now the second phase is uh, supported by uh, Norwegian uh, Embassy. So, I just want to say that a dialogue uh, doesn't have alternative. And if we build up a functional society in Srebrenica and Bratunac, then we can talk about function and creator and uh, uh, stolas. Then we can talk about fa functional society in Sarajevo and uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Before opening the floor to more others, let me try to summarize the points I would like to have heard. Have with me here very experienced uh, experts noted from different fields, therefore, their approaches were both legal, constitutional, criminal law, diplomatic, uh, and uh, perfectly approachable. I would say what you would say that are doing there. Collective psychological therapy, isn't it? Something like that. It needs to be this way of approach. Um, I have two conclusions from that. I think that this has uh, uh, showed to us that we need, while discussing uh, R2P and conflict prevention, we need more such knowledge of specific case studies. Did you notice what the difference and variety and richness of ideas? And they only were just having 15 minutes to say, summarizing a lot of activities in terms of uh, Nansen Dialogue Center since over 12 years in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, that's one of uh, the observations. As you see, uh, R2P, conflict prevention, need still very much the development of our knowledge multidisciplinary knowledge and of, uh, of uh, methodology. I remember in my office in The Hague when we dealt with national minorities, national ethnic minorities, one of the lessons we have learned from a number of NGOs and scholars dealing with it is a question of development of different uh, uh, instruments, sort of toolbox for uh, conflict prevention. I have heard on that time quite recently, uh, about third generation of conflict prevention. The first one being uh, just a regular diplomatic and media monitoring of the situation, which gives certain perception for us diplomats. Yeah? Then there is a second one, when you <coughs> second special envoys, special people, be they representing governments or international organizations, to watch the situation on the spot, you see, etc., with these kind of functions. And there is a third one, which is interesting. This is monitoring the question of inter-ethnic tensions by local, very much local persons, both personnel of NGOs, seconded there for some time, and of local activists, teachers, journalists, etc. Only then you may have a broader picture, uh, broader picture of the situation. As you know, both uh, Rwanda and uh, Srebrenica were the cases which could have been prevented because there was a 
knowledge, and there was information, there was intelligence about something going so wrong over a certain threshold. Uh, first boss, first high commissioner of national minorities, Max van der Stuhl, let us also yet one uh, thing. Namely, when we discuss these matters, when we talk to government people, we should raise financial argument. He gave us examples when he convinced his government to fund a lot of uh, um, expenses of the office of the OSC, including about over one million for supporters and all the other things. He said that, look how much you pay, he was Minister for Foreign Affairs for the twice, how much you pay regularly for one medium range uh, nuclear missile. Only take this one. Secondly, there are studies showing how much this is cheaper, the conflict prevention, in comparison to costs of post-conflict rehabilitation. This is enormous proportion. Those clerks, book accountants in the ministry should be made aware of that. Politicians with vision at least more than one budgetary year. Therefore, we can say that, as you remember, you particularly agree that prevention is always better than cure. We can also say, therefore, that prevention is always cheaper than post-conflict uh, rehabilitation and stabilization process. This is what we have in the Balkans. If uh, we just make count for what uh, has been spent here and will have to be spent, we must be strong on this uh, on this argu argument because this is still an unfinished business. Thank you very much for your uh, contributions. But I would like to open the floor to the public whether there are any questions to our panelists or to me. Thank you. Stay it's more like a comment because I often been confronted with this and uh, I want to share with you because we are here a lot of people from Canada. People ask me what's uh, our exit strategy and uh, I say I don't have one. And exit strategies are for those who plan to exit but exit in the wrong way. So to improve the way they exit. But we have confused it by concluding that somehow everybody needs to exit. That's why we get all these sunset projects with a beginning and an end. And if the project has some kind of, gives the feeling that it opens up another application three years down the road for twice as much money, which reconciliation often means, then uh, people get scared. So to talk about these processes is something that we try to do as long-term <coughs> processes. But I do make a big difference uh, using this uh, story you have in Norway and it's around the world. If people are hungry, give them fish, give them fishing equipment, and teach them how to fish. We are not much at all. But we can go fishing together. They know where the fish is biting. They know probably what to use. But there are certain things I can do as well, help them carry the equipment and inspire along the way. Then people say, but that's dependency. I say, no, it's cooperation. There is something.